Good afternoon. The first item of business is a debate on motion 3298 in the name of James Dornan on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee on the performance and role of the SQA, Education Scotland, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on James Dornan to speak and move a motion on behalf of the Education and Skills Committee. Mr Dornan, 14 minutes, please. Presiding officer. This debate is happening today because the committee was struck by the views it received from frontline staff as part of its recent scrutiny of public bodies, in particular on the Scottish Qualifications Authority. We wanted to highlight this to the Parliament as a whole. It is also an opportune moment to debate the role of the SQA, Education Scotland, the Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland bodies, since they are all covered by the terms of a government review at present, whether it be the Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland under the Enterprise and Skills Review, or the SQA and Education Scotland within the Education Governance Review. I want to start with a quick whistle-top tour for non-committee members of how the committee sourced this valuable evidence. The committee decided an early piece of work it should undertake was an assessment of how well the key public organisations overseeing school education, further education, higher education and skills for young people were delivering. The ways we gathered views are not new, but the combination of them led to a very credible thread of issues for members to pursue. From the off, the Education and Skills Committee made incl inclusivity a strategic priority in its work. To me, this means trying to make the ways we invite evidence as unintimidating as possible. Our focus on the public bodies' work was getting candid views from frontline staff that we could use to challenge the big bodies. We wanted to make sure the link between practical frontline experience and the way these bodies' functions is there. In gathering views, we were aware that submitting evidence to Parliament can be very daunting. Even a language submitting evidence would understandably put a lot of individuals off. This barrier can sometimes prevent us from receiving the most candid and therefore valuable views. The key to our work was offering anonymity through three means. Firstly, a survey. Secondly, anonymous submissions. And thirdly, a meeting with teachers. The meeting was a relatively random sample of teachers who were coming to Parliament for another reason as part of our education centre's work towards the professional development of teachers. That meeting, which I attended with my colleague Ross Greer, was a valuable lesson for me. I got into the room with an idea of what I was going to hear, and the views of those teachers certainly rewrote my take on quite a few things. What was stark from this meeting and the submission from teachers was that, especially with the promise of anonymity, there was an outpouring of views from some contributors there. It has to be said, the real strength of feeling was about the functioning of the SQA. You need only read the submission from the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers, for example, to get a sense of that. What was even more notable was the extent to which the views in the SQA from teacher submissions and submissions from some academics and some other stakeholders were along very similar lines. And perhaps most notable was the survey response in the SQA. Despite survey results summary highlights, as it is appropriate to do so, the limitations of the survey. This is not a random sample and therefore, of course, is not representative of the views of all teachers. But over 646 people, including 462 teachers, chose to respond in the SQA compared to 340 people in Education Scotland, which included 211 teachers. It is telling that over twice as many teachers chose to respond in the SQA. From the 646 responses in the SQA, 67% of respondents disagreed or disagreed strongly with the statement that SQA's customers and users trust it to get it right for them. Even acknowledging the limitations of the survey results, that result is very hard to ignore. All this evidence led to a very searching evidence session with the SQA, with detailed and varied comments from teachers' anonymous submissions, adding real resonance to the criticisms that the committee members put to the SQA's chief executive. This ability for the committee to act as a mouthpiece for teachers gave the SQA a clear understanding of the challenges it faced from those in the know, the teachers themselves. At the end of the session, I made clear that the committee would expect changes to be made, in particular given the amount of change underway, underway that the SQA is responsible for overseeing. For example, changes resulting from the removal of unit assessments. The SQA left the meeting with a very clear message that it needs to make improvements and make them fast. The committee did hear some positive views in the SQA and the SQA did highlight to the committee the positive feedback it has received through its own independently commissioned work. So there are of course other views out there, but the SQA was accepting of the strength of the results generated when teachers were given the opportunity to speak freely to an independent committee. Moving on to the other organisations, the SDS and SFC had a positive report card from the survey granted from a far smaller sample. The SDS also had its progress to report on the delivery of the government's aims for modern apprenticeships. It continues to meet its overall targets in this regard. 
Engagement and delivery at a local level and equalities considerations in the delivery of its work were raised in written evidence and therefore were a focus of the evidence session with the SDS. I'm sure other members will pick up on these issues in more detail later in the debate. The role of the Scottish Funding Council was explored in its evidence session, including the importance of being able to demonstrate to key stakeholders such as universities and colleges, where it is performing a challenge function to government. The discussion and role highlighted the need for further clarity and the exact implications of the Enterprise and Skills Review and Scottish Funding Council, given its board will be replaced by an overarching board, as recommended by Phase 1. The committee decided, having heard this evidence, that it would be prudent to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work on these issues. The committee then wrote to the Cabinet Secretary following the meeting seeking more information on which bodies had suggested the removal of the SFC to be replaced by an overarching board. As the committee stated in this letter, the committee is committed to testing the evidence base for this recommendation and will undoubtedly give the Phase 2 findings consideration in the spring. The session with the fourth body, Education Scotland, included a focus on the dual role of the body, something which members of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Education Committee have been very prominent on. Education Scotland refuted the suggestion there was a conflict of interest and suggested that the distinct roles were clear. Since then, I see a number of submissions to the Governance Review have com commented upon this. So again, this is another likely theme for today today's debate. Lastly, specifically on Education Scotland, there was a focus on the types and frequency of inspection that would add value to schools, as some of the survey results from teachers suggested the school inspections had not always added a lot of value from their perspective. I'd like to quickly make comment on some of the themes that arose relating to education bodies in relation to the curriculum for excellence. The burden on teachers having been excessive was acknowledged by the SQA, Education Scotland and Education Authority representatives during their separate evidence sessions. And work is underway at the Cabinet Secretary's behest to reduce this burden. But the committee wants to look at how this arose in the first place. And so having heard from these bodies, we'll hear from the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board next week to establish whether everyone is clear who is responsible for what and ensuring strong decision taking. This will include looking back at a number of key decisions taken in the evolution of the curriculum for excellence and the process of implementation. In particular, I will be interested to learn whether those who should be acting as a challenge function to ensure that the cumulative amount of information produced is not excessive are fulfilling that role. Local authorities and, and their role as education authorities and also as responsible employers should see part of their core role as protecting the well-being of their workforce and ensuring that workforce is protected from excessive working demands. Local authority representatives on the board should be well appraised of the practical experience of teachers and other staff working in education through strong lines of communication with the various education authorities that they represent. The focus of this debate is not education authorities, but I want to highlight the importance of the role they play in acting as a challenge function to the SQA in Education Scotland and others on the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. The evidence we received from COSLA, in my personal view, gave the impression that they had not performed the challenge function teachers would expect of them in the face of excessive, excessive guidance going to teachers. In my view, that is not acceptable. It's also not acceptable to prevent parliamentary committees from speaking to teachers to gather their views. And this was the case when one of our members sought to meet teachers local to his area. His education authority told him he could not do this. Now, I have every sympathy for if teachers do not have time to meet members, but for an education authority to deny communication with teachers who are happy to engage is not something the committee will accept, and therefore we have written to the education authority in question for an explanation. It's fair to say I await their response with some interest. I do want to make it clear, though, that this issue was only encountered with one education authority and that other members, including myself, undertook visits to schools in their local area to inform their committee's work without any issues at all. Can I thank the teachers and the support staff who made these visits possible? Turning back to the four bodies in question, I hope my broad summary of issues explored with the bodies give, gives members who are not on the committee a sense of the areas the committee has explored. I should emphasise that today we are talking about performance and role. Our members do not plan to cover detail on the future budget provision for these organisations, as that would put us in danger of veering towards budget recommendations that are not yet in the public domain. Rather, we are looking at the key issues in the paper circulated for the debate, and these include are these bodies delivering on their core functions? Should the role of these organisations or their structures change as a result of the Education Governance Review or the Enterprise and Skills Review? Are these organisations sufficiently mindful of equalities when delivering their functions? And do these bodies respond effectively to the needs of stakeholders and to constructive advice? The motion for debate mentions the importance of parliamentary scrutiny, and this means a joined-up approach from backbenchers to have the greatest impact. 
I had not anticipated when I became convener the number of other committees that would become involved in issues that cross over into a broad remit. In my last count, it was seven other committees. Don't get me wrong, this additional scrutiny is to be welcomed. I just want to ensure, as part of my role, that it is coordinated, that progress made in other committees or other parts of the Parliament's work is communicated to us and vice versa. For example, the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee has undertaken valuable work scrutinising the Scottish Funding Council as follow-up work in Audit Scotland's overview reports on universities and colleges. Coordinating scrutiny across committees will be particularly important when looking at the proposal stemming from government reviews. How we do so effectively might be a matter for the conveners group to consider further. Understandably, the Local Government and Communities, Com Communities Committee intended to look at any proposals from the Education Governance Review that impact on the role of local government and their role as education authorities and any changes in the associated funding levels. In addition, the Economy, Fair Work and Jobs Committee took evidence at Phase 1 of the Enterprise and Skills Review, including from Skills Development Scotland, and may well look again at proposals at Phase 2. The second letter that the Education and Skills Committee received from the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work suggested there would be further consultation at Phase 2, and so there is a further opportunity for parliamentary input. And of course there will be legislation to bring about the proposals that result from the Education Governance Review and the Enterprise and Skills Review. In my last couple of minutes I, I want to look back to the evidence gathering. I placed a good deal of emphasis on the evidence from teachers and so I'd wish to also give my sincere thanks to those bodies and academics who have taken the time to contribute their views to the committee. It's sometimes a delicate process for organisations that have valuable working relationships with public bodies to provide constructive criticism through a parliamentary consultation about those bodies. I'd also like to specifically thank the organisations that we scrutinised. They have all been very accommodating in assisting the committee with its work. For example, a number of members visited local SDS offices or projects in the fortnight leading up to the evidence session, including myself. The committee wishes to thank Skills Development Scotland for facilitating these visits, in particular tailoring each visit to the specific interests of each of our members. The Scottish Funding Council, Education Scotland and the Scottish Qualifications Authority also arranged visits or attended informal meetings with small groups of members to give us more of a sense of their day-to-day -day activity. This included in some cases involving more junior staff than those who give evidence to committee. This provided a useful insight into the work of organisations at an operational as well as a strategic level. Finally, in relation to future work, the committee will seek to build on its first experience of engaging the views of frontline staff, including on the education legislation arising from the governance review. And of course, engagement with parents and, and indeed children and young people will be crucial too. So I want to close with a general shout out to those who have something to say, but have a misconception that they need to wait to see what a committee focuses on in its work programme, or wait to be invited to contribute in a formal format before they can express a view. That is not how our committee is working. Every year a young person, a parent, or work in one of our schools, colleges, universities, or within the organisations that we scrutinise, and you think things need to change to improve the opportunities and experiences of our young people, we want to hear from you. One of the teachers who wrote to us even stated that the committee's questioning of the SQA based on, our, on teachers' views restored their faith in politicians. Now, I would venture we still have a wee bit more to do <laughs> uh, to convince other people in that regard, but this piece of work is a strong start. And I want to finish off now by thanking my fellow committee members for their contribution and support. All of my fantastic clerking team led by the inimitable Roz Thompson, brilliantly supported by Ned Sharrett. And most importantly, I wish to thank the teachers and others for taking the time to share their valuable experience with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Mr Swinney, restored faith in politicians. Therefore, I call on you to answer on behalf of the government, to open the government. Uh, nine minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this afternoon's debate brought forward by the Education and Skills Committee and of the issues covered by the convener in his introductory remarks. This is an opportunity for the government to reaffirm our commitment to doing the very best we can for children and young people and to ensure that, to ensure that every one of those young people can fulfil their potential uh, through their participation in the Scottish education system. That commitment is also shared by Education Scotland, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council, bodies which play a crucial role in delivering and improving high quality education in Scotland. The committee has undertaken considerable scrutiny of the performance of these national agencies and the 
convener has um, explained some of that detail in his remarks already. It has questioned them on specific criticism raised through its online surveys and has identified issues on which they have challenged the SQA and Education Scotland, particularly on performance, on communication and on guidance. I wish to make clear to the Chamber that I welcome feedback from anyone with a stake in Scottish education. Indeed, I spend a great deal of my time engaged in exactly that pursuit. And I, was, and I will always expect the highest standards from national bodies charged with improving outcomes for young people in Scotland. But at the outset of this debate, without questioning the importance of holding these agencies to account, I want to make it clear that I believe these agencies contribute a significant amount of positive benefit to the delivery of Scottish education. In the most recent survey undertaken by the Scottish Qualification, independently on behalf of the Scottish Qualifications Authority, uh, and this report was published in January 2016, 84% of respondents believed that the SQA had high credibility and 91% believed that the, S the, the SQA could be trusted as an organisation. In its assessment of the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, said that Education Scotland has been a linchpin in providing the guidance resources and quality assurance for the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. So, as well as acknowledging the criticism that can be levelled at organisations, and of course there is criticism that can be levelled at all organisations, it is important that we place on record the fact that there is significant strength in these organisations that contributes towards the delivery of Scottish education and the performance that we experience in Scottish education. And it's important at the outset of this debate that we focus on the questions of what all of this produces, of what is the, uh, the impact and the outcome of all of this activity. And I want to go through with, with Parliament a number of examples about the current performance of Scottish education. The overwhelming majority of children in our education system are performing well in school under Curriculum for Excellence. At least 84% of pupils are achieving the expected level or better in literacy and numeracy by the end of S3. The number of advanced higher passes reached a record high in 2016, while the number of higher passes was second only to the record high in 2015. More of our population is educated beyond school than any other European country, and a higher percentage of young people now leave school for positive destinations than at any time on record. We've seen annual increases in the proportion of school leavers reaching at least SCQF level 5, 73.2% in 2008, reaching 85.2% in 2014-15. And the gap between our 20% most and least deprived pupils achieving this level has reduced from 36.8 percentage points in 2008 to 20.9 percentage points in 2014-15. While school leavers from our 10% least deprived communities are around twice as likely as those from the 10% most deprived communities to achieve at least one qualification at higher or above, this is a notable improvement on the position in 2007-8 when they were almost four times as likely to do so. The gap between those from the most and the least deprived communities in positive follow-up school leaver destinations continues to narrow. For 2014-15, the gap was 10 percentage points, uh, down from 20.2 percentage points in 2009-10, which is the earliest year for which comparable data exists. And finally, in 2014-15, 14 percent of Scottish domiciled full-time first degree entrants to Scottish universities were from SIMD 20, up from 11.2% in 2006-07. So whilst there is legitimate ground for us to consider and to challenge and to press for improvements in performance in Scottish education, there are very strong foundations upon which we build at this time. I'll give way. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I wanted to ask him about the SIMD, uh, SMID uh, figures that he, he just raised there. Is he aware that University Scotland and a number of individual universities have, have drawn uh, question marks really over the efficacy of using SIMD on its own and not with other indicators to make sure that it is actually the most, the, 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 um, most deprived pupils that are getting into university and not more affluent pupils who happen to live in that postcode? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think that there, there are 
may well be issues that uh, have to be considered, and that's precisely why we've appointed a commissioner for widening access to make sure that these issues can be thoroughly considered. But I think it is important that we record on a comparative basis the progress that has been made on that very important indicator to demonstrate the strength of the improvements in performance that are being achieved. Now, as the government embarks on, uh, an, on its reform agenda in education, based on very solid foundations, we have to be mindful of the fact that the some of the data that we heard prior to Christmas was extremely challenging data about the performance of the education system. And our reform agenda is designed to address those issues. And one of those key aspects is the review of governance, which closed just on Friday. At its heart is the presumption that decisions about children's learning and school life should be made at school level. We'll be looking closely at the responses that we have had, including to consider the roles of Education Scotland and the SQA, as I indicated at the outset we would do. But I make the point to Parliament that the delivery of success in Scottish education is not just down to the work of the SQA or Education Scotland. The performance of Scottish education is influenced by a whole range of organisations, including the Scottish Government, and significantly, most significantly, by local authorities who carry the statutory responsibility to deliver effective education for all. The purpose of the governance review is to ensure that every element of the system fulfills their roles to the highest standards that we can expect. And the government will bring forward relevant proposals back to Parliament in due course based on the outcome of the research in the governance review. Now, excellent education is vital for our society, not just for our economy, but most importantly for the individual life chances of every single child and young person. Our education and training system must support every one of those individuals to make their contribution to our economy. The Enterprise and Skills Review highlighted by the motion will help us to achieve that and I want to put on record that I welcome the committee's scrutiny of that process. I also welcome their support for its ambition to take fresh action towards our long-term ambition encapsulated in Scotland's economic strategy to rank in the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity, equality, well-being and sustainability. That is the focus and the purpose of the governance review uh, of the Enterprise and Skills Review. It is to establish how by, estab by creating greater alignment and greater cohesion between the work of Scottish Enterprise, Hans Arns Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Fund Funding Council, we can ensure that we take the necessary collaborative and cohesive steps to improve the economic performance of Scotland and to build on the strong foundations established in our education system. As the convener correctly says, phase two of that process um, has commenced and the government will be delighted to uh, engage with parliament and with committees on the progress of phase two of that review. Uh, together with the learner journey, which we will commence in due course, and the school governance reforms, this work will help to create a more seamless and focused education and skills system in Scotland, which will give every young person the best opportunity they can to prosper through our education system, but also give them the greatest uh, opportunity to make a contribution to the economic life of Scotland. The government welcomes this opportunity to debate and to consider the role of these agencies, but I stress the point to Parliament that is of significance. Education and its success is as a consequence of the work and the uh, participation of a whole range of different organisations, not just the four organisations that are part of this debate today. And I look forward to reflecting on the debate in my concluding remarks later this afternoon. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, I call on Ms Smith for the Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to the convener uh, of the Education and the Skills Committee for setting out the parameters of this debate. And he's quite correct to say that we have to scrutinise these public bodies, we have to measure their respective performances against the Scottish Government's national performance framework, how they evaluate the quality of their delivery, how they manage change in terms of the Christie Commission, etc. But good quality scrutiny is, of course, entirely dependent upon the availability and the effective analysis of the evidence provided. And I want to examine both of these. And can I do so in light of my 10 years in attending committee sessions in this parliament, which I believe are the most important forum for establishing the detail that members and indeed the public need to know before they make political judgments on specific issues and before policy is developed. As the convener rightly intimated, the committee heard, heard very, four, very strong four lengthy sessions. And that was a result of 
several things. Firstly, the volume of the responses that we received, and as he pointed out, some of them uh, were from uh, an anonymous position to allow free expression. And secondly, because it naturally the Scottish Government has put such store on education, it was right and proper that it was a very comprehensive and wide-ranging review. And as such, I think it's difficult to know where to start, but let me begin uh, with what happened in these committee sessions themselves. As this Parliament is well aware, there were some extraordinary exchanges during these sessions in November and December, which made it all too clear that each of these four public bodies currently faces significant problems, albeit to varying degrees. And as such, in some cases, they have lost the confidence of some key people in the education profession. I think what struck me most of all was the issue about communication within and between these four public bodies. Far too often the committee was faced with jargon instead of plain English, the irony of course being that this is the time that the country is trying to improve literacy and numeracy, and as such the evidence was often muddled and open to different interpretations. At times it was actually unintelligible and therefore the lines of responsibility were unclear. All of these issues were a matter of concern and they are slightly different from the issues of the fact that we receive very conflicting views from the agencies and professionals on the ground, something that of course is quite normal within the committee system. The committee convener reflected upon the strong views amongst teachers and he's right to do so. This mattered because as we tried to reconcile completely contrasting views, it became increasingly apparent through, I may say, the evidence provided by more than one of these agencies that the criteria by which the evidence was being produced was not consistent and in some cases it was actually incomplete and I'll come back to that in just a minute. My colleagues will concentrate on specific areas of the evidence in this res in respect, but I want to develop some important general principles, four in particular. Firstly, there are clearly issues about strategic decision-making and the respective timescales in which this takes place. More than once, reservations have been expressed about the fact that the strategic decision-making is compromised by the lack of a longer-term approach. And I use the example of the concerns amongst colleges and universities that their longer term sustainability, which is obviously so important to the maintenance of their competitive advantage, is threatened by the fact that the Scottish Funding Council appears to live from year to year rather than looking at a three year or perhaps a five year term. And that's a point that's been raised by Audit Scotland and it's obviously something that was raised at the Audit Committee of this Parliament on the 1st of December. Lack of effective strategy is also the main reason why there have been so many changes to policy and guidelines within SQA and Education Scotland. Changes which the Cabinet Secretary uh, recognised when he announced his bid to declutter the CFE landscape. The OECD mentioned this crucial point too when it flagged up the long list of CFE capacities, attributes, cap capabilities, levels, 1,820 outcomes and experiences. And it is the fact that these have all been changed and amended several times and now replaced with new ones, albeit fewer and simpler in number. But we should be very clear that it is not the teachers who asked for these edicts, but the agencies themselves. And when you hear that the excuse for mistakes being made within exams, and we have had some, is because that there has been an overburden of workload, then it is little wonder that that does not inspire the confidence amongst teachers. And what I worry about most, and what I'm sure parents are worried about, is the effective delivery of the curriculum for excellence, which is the single biggest educational reform in a generation. And of course, the impact that that then has on qualifications and on subject choice in the senior phase. These are really serious issues and the committee is right to be concerned. Secondly, we heard on several occasions that there are question marks over whether the agencies have sufficient resources and whether they're able to deploy them properly. It's a question raised by colleges and universities about the Scottish Funding Council, not about the skill set of its staff, but whether there are sufficient of them with the skills to ensure that Scottish Funding Council officers have the in-depth knowledge of the institutions and the outcome agreements for what they are responsible. It's a question raised about SQA when it comes to finding sufficient markers at the right time with the right knowledge for the wide diversity of qualifications now being sat. And it's a question that needs to be answered by Education Scotland, uh, how it feels able to take on the dual role of being judge and jury when it comes to the main body that both implements education policy and also inspects our schools. And on that same theme, we have had issues about the accuracy of data. In the session with Education Scotland, there was a complete lack of clarity when it came to them commenting on their own table, which was supposed to show the number of school inspections. We were left unclear 
about whether there were statistics that included projections or not. And in one case, there appeared to be arithmetic which told the committee that the number of inspections had fallen when there was a contorted attempt to, act to say that it actually had risen. That is simply not acceptable. And that is something that I think we need to uh, do something about radically and quickly. And let me come to the wider issue of data, because again, this was a comment picked up by the committee evidence and by the OECD. Namely, that Scotland does not have the sufficient relevant baseline data at the start of the CFE and therefore is not in a position to be able to do enough proper analysis of exactly what progress is being made in the curriculum for excellence. Finally, I think there have been questions about the links between the Scottish Government and its agencies, whether the latter are in fact at arm's length bodies or whether they are being drawn more and more into government direction. Indeed, I think it's completely unclear as to what the management board of the Curriculum for Excellence has actually been doing for nine years, and therefore there are questions about its responsibilities. May I finish, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, on the fact that in November and December, the Education Committee was an eye-opener, but it was also deeply worrying, as I think the various sessions collectively showed just exactly why the Education and Skills Brief is providing the Scottish Government with so many headaches. We wholeheartedly support the work of the convener. We want to thank the work of the clerks. And may I say that I think we have an awful lot of work to do to bring these education agencies to account. They are simply not doing well enough. And that is a matter of great concern to this parliament. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Call on Daniel Johnson to open for Labour, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's education system is critical to the future of our country and vital if our young people are to fulfil their uh, potential. Yet our once lauded system is falling behind on international measures. The Education and Skills Committee uh, work compounds those concerns, having found serious issues with the organisations responsible for our exams, inspections and the curriculum. These conclusions point clearly to what we need to fix in Scotland's education system. I'd like to thank colleagues on the Education and Skills Committee for bringing this debate forward. Indeed, I'd like to thank the convener, James Dornan, for I think his very thorough uh, summary of the, the evidence that we have looked at. I'd also like to thank the clerks and Spice for preparing the reports and information provided to us, specifically the very helpful paper sent to all MSPs this week. I think one of the things that marks out the seriousness of this debate is the fact that that paper needs to ask such a fundamental question as, do our educational bodies deliver on their core functions. Now, I know not every member was glued to their TV screens while the committee was taking all its evidence. So these questions may come as a bit of a surprise, but let me read from the official report when the head of the SQA said that the negative views around qualifications were because of the way in which they, and I quote, have been designed and implemented and the way in which they have worked. When a chief exec says, don't worry, the problems are just about how we plan how we operate and how everything works. You have to conclude that something is seriously wrong. The significance of the problems were emphasised by a survey conducted for the committee, which revealed a crisis of confidence in these agencies from teachers. The committee's evidence indicates that teachers no longer have trust in the SQA or Education Scotland. Just 20% of survey respondents trusted the SQA to, quote, get it right. Teachers pointed to unclear documentation, change with fatigue, inconsistency. The majority of teachers expressed criticism of Education Scotland's guidance and support. More than half expressed reservations about the independence of evaluation of education provision. These initial concerns were compounded by the evidence we received from the organisations themselves. Not only is there a failure in how these organisations are interacting with teachers, but there was a failure to explain how they are accountable, responsible, or indeed delivering on what they are charged with. The evidence the committee received showed that the SQA's faults with particular exams, such as the higher maths paper in 2015 or geography last year, whether the teaching time for each exam over a single year was possible, and indeed who had responsibility for the design of that. Neither the SQA nor Education Scotland were able to explain how the curriculum and the examination system were meant to work together, or indeed who was responsible for that integration. The narrowing of the curriculum as a result of the new exam system was called into question. Education uh, Scotland failed to explain the fallen inspections, and indeed they couldn't explain their independence in their, that role 
given its other functions. So when you reel off this litany of failures by these key organisations, surely it should be part of uh, this part of the system, uh, these government agencies that need reform, rather than the government's plans to just simply shift power around between schools and local authorities. The government have not presented sufficient evidence that their plans will help improve standards. The government, in the words of the Royal Society for Edinburgh, and I quote, have not made the case. And children in Scotland, which represents 500 bodies across the public, private and voluntary sectors, said that there was virtually no evidence to support the view that changing governance will reduce the attainment gap. Most worrying is the respected worldwide study, PISA, which came out last month that showed that a decade after a decade of SNP stewardship of the education system, we have seen standards go backwards. Across the core measures of reading, maths and science, Scotland has gone from being one of the best to merely or indeed barely average. The children in this study have spent their whole school lives under curriculum for excellence, under the guidance of the SNP. I believe it's worth returning the OECD report published in December 2015. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Johnson for giving me. I'm interested in his point about uh, curriculum for excellence and the experience of young people. Do I deduce from what he's just said that Mr Johnson is no longer a supporter of curriculum for excellence? No. No, okay. Uh, I, Mr I, Johnson. I, no, if, 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 uh, uh, presiding officer, the point is about the way that curriculum ex for excellence integrates with the examination system. This was the very point that both the SQA and Education Scotland were entirely unable to explain who had taken responsibility for those core points of integration between those two elements of the, the junior and senior phase in senior school. And that is a highly worrying conclusion uh, to have arrived at. So returning to the OECD report published in December 2015, that said that curriculum for excellence was at a make or break moment. Indeed, reading from the report one year on, they imagine the negative scenario of a context of criticism and cuts that could lead to micromanagement from the centre and growing tension between government and councils. So people will rightly ask whether the SNP are walking down this exact road of cuts and centralisation which the OECD so clearly warned us against. At this make or break moment, surely the focus must be on Education Scotland and the SQA, the bodies responsible for making curriculum for excellence work. When we have the body of evidence in front of us, surely this is where reform must lie. Where is the ambition, indeed the effort, as the OECD put it, to unleash the potential of curriculum for excellence? Now, the First Minister has said that her top priority is education. Indeed, the Deputy First Minister has come to his new role saying he's got the answers, that his governance review is the thing that will fix education in Scotland. Indeed, he is using the fact that Scottish education is facing the issues, as highlighted by PISA, as justification for his preferred reforms. But these failures are the result of his party's time in government. It is the SNP who created Education Scotland, which now can't explain who is responsible for curriculum for excellence. It is this Scottish government which created the exams which our teachers are now struggling to make work. And it is this administration who are overseeing these bodies who are experiencing a catastrophic loss of trust from the teaching profession. Before this debate, we knew the legacy of 10 years of SNP government 4,000 fewer teachers in our schools, 1,000, no thank you, 1,000 fewer support staff, and Scotland's fall from the world's leading to barely or merely average. But today's debate shows us that the government are not just failing to fund education properly, but they are failing to run it properly too. Dysfunction in the two main education agencies, problems with the way our curriculum and exams work, a crisis of confidence from our teacher. And so, yes, we need reform, but the SNP should look to their own record and fix the mistakes they have made. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. We now move to the open debate. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Liam Kerr. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Education and Skills Committee, it gives me great pleasure to contribute to this debate and I want to start my contribution by paying tribute and giving thanks to the many, many teachers, assistants and various other staff who work tirelessly day in and day out in our schools and wider education system, including some of the bodies mentioned by the convener and other speakers. The, the Chamber may remember it was just June 2014, less than three years ago, when the ONS showed that Scotland was the most educated country in Europe. And I think that that's important to keep in mind as we go through this debate and 
A scrutinising has been tough at times on the witnesses and members, as the convener has already said. So it's important to remember that we do have the basis of a world-class education system that has been renowned. Presiding officer, in the sixth. Sorry, Mr. McGregor. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are members finding the microphones aren't so clear? Can I just make that point uh, to recording? If you'd do something about the microphones so they're clearer. Sorry to stop you in your stride, but I think we do want to hear you properly. Okay, thanks. Um, Presiding officer, on the 16th of November, I visited the SQA offices in Glasgow with my committee colleague, Ross Thompson. So I think it's fair that I use my time to talk a wee bit about them as our evidence session with the SQA was, after all, what brought around this debate. When Mr Thompson and I visited, we met with Janet Brown and a number of senior officials. We heard about the day-to-day -day work of the SQA, engagement with teachers and schools, development of awards and how performance is generally measured. We also had the privilege of meeting some of the staff and heard about the customer management and the particular difficulties on results day and how this is handled. But further to that, we, we have to take into account the evidence received, which the conveners talked about, which was far from complimentary. Teachers taking time to contact us about concerns they had about the SQA, raising questions about the functioning of the SQA, the pressures on teachers, the organisation, with some questioning, was it fit for purpose? But I also do think that it's worth noting that the survey size was around 400 plus out of 50,000 plus teachers. Over the last few years, we've heard a lot about the silent majority. I hadn't heard this term until a couple of years ago. But what does this then say about the 49,500 or so who didn't respond? Are they happy? Are they satisfied? Or do indeed those who responded speak for all? I'm not sure. I can't say with any certainty, and I don't know the MDLs here can. I merely pose the question. Now I know there will be colleagues in the chamber today to my left and my right, who will think that by me raising the validity of the, of the survey that I am somehow not scrutinising. And I would like to say that I, that's far from it. I have a slightly different view and I don't believe that every time we scrutinise it needs to be bad, bad, dare I say it, hashtag bad. I come from a, a different angle that when scrutinising you can still do it through a positive framework and I believe that's how I will continue to take it forward, as I do believe my colleagues in this party and government. And I don't think people want us, or our teachers, or, or people want us to be necessarily negative all the time when we're scrutinising. And I do think that Mr Johnson's approach was particularly negative. Yes, OK. Ms Smith. I, th I, th I thank him for doing so. I think he makes a very important point that scrutiny is not always about being bad. It is about being good too. The key point, however, as he will acknowledge, given some of the good questions that he asked uh, of the education agencies, is that we got muddled and confused evidence that did not allow us to carry out the scrutiny effectively. Would he accept that? Mr McGregor. Well, I'd, I'd like to continue on and, and develop my point further, and I thank, uh, to, I thank the member for, for making the intervention. Because what, what, no, what I was actually going on to say was that the views of those who did contribute absolutely must be taken into account. And I don't think that anybody anybody would deny that. I was merely putting the, the views into the context of how many people had actually responded to the survey. Um, and for the, for the avoidance of any doubt, I would like to actually just quote what I said to Janet Brown and the SQA during the committee evidence session, which when I read again, I had thought at the time, when I, when I read it again, I thought actually was quite balanced on the face of it. So I said at that, at that evidence session, there is no escaping the fact that the submissions are very damning for you. Indeed, you have reflected that view. Can you convince me and this committee that you will seek to change the nature of the relationship between the SQA and teachers? I would like to get an answer that would make me think that when you come back next year, things will have changed. I think that you are capable of doing that. Indeed, the team who we met last week are fantastic. Your opening statement and your previous two responses have covered the facts, but I want to feel convinced." End quote. I hope that the improvements that we all seek will be made and we will be able to discuss this in the Parliament at some point in the future. Moving on, President Officer, as members will know, I have had some excellent educational facilities in my constituency and I take every opportunity to praise them here during debates and members' debates. Indeed, just yesterday, during an excellent debate brought forward by Liz Smith, I highlighted the excellent work being done by four primary schools in relation to physical activity the Daily Mail, and this has been done through the Curriculum for Education framework, and I was very pleased to be able to do that. And each of those four primary schools retweeted and commented um, 
last night on that particular debate. However, as the convener alluded to, it was disappointing that significant barriers were put up by North Lancashire Council to prevent teachers from being involved in the committee process. Most of us have a good relationship with each of the schools and some of the members of the senior staff at North Lanarkshire's HQ, such as Isabel Boyd, who I'll give a mention to, and they didn't seem to have any major objections to the process. So unfortunately, you know, I, I wasn't going to comment, but when the convener mentioned his statement, I would like to point out that unfortunately the decision has appeared to be political in nature, and as it's local and the convener and I have taken it up with the council leader, I will leave it at that, and I do believe that the council leader will not be satisfied with how the situation was dealt with. President officer, let me finish off where I started by thanking those involved in the system for the amazing job that they do. Education is the most important part of any society, I believe, so the commitment of the government and the Cab Secretary to make education Scotland's number one priority is an important one. As we've already heard, the government is committed uh, to funding and, and to reducing the attainment gap. There is a lot of work to be done in this area, as other members have said, and everyone in this chamber, every local authority and anyone who is involved in education, from nursery to university, should be prepared to work together constructively and in a positive, upbeat manner to make sure Scotland retains its status as a world leader in education. Thank you. Thank you. We had some time in hand, so I give a, a minute or so over for interventions. I give Liam, I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Monica Lennon. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. On the 16th of November 2016, Dr John Kemp, Interim Director of the Scottish Funding Council, appeared before the Education Committee. He stated that the ambition of the SFC is Scotland will be the best place in the world in which to educate, learn, research and innovate. He added the SFC's task is to care for and develop the whole system of colleges and universities and their connections with and contribution to Scotland's educational, social and cultural life. I do not doubt it, nor that its dedicated staff are committed to these ambitions. However, despite its position as a non-departmental public body of the Scottish Government operating at arm's length, there is significant concern articulated well by NUS Scotland that the SFC must not simply implement ministerial guidance and must remain more than a vehicle through which funding is delivered. The distance between ministers and the SFC is becoming increasingly blurred. And what's more, those at the SFC and in charge of our higher education system are aware that the public and indeed our education professionals are losing confidence in how education is being managed in our country. One of the major initiatives of this government in the area of higher education has been the merger and creation of regional colleges. And to say that the reaction, not least in the public audit committee scrutiny sessions, has been mixed would be putting it mildly. In November 2015, the EIS published a survey of college lecturers in Scotland. 89% did not believe the merger had improved learning and teaching quality. 91% did not believe their merger had improved management of their college. 94% did not believe their merger had improved staff morale. I won't, it's important you hear this, so uh, if you want to write to me afterwards, I undertake to respond. <laughs> the government... Uh, I'm afraid that's rather pompous, but go for it. <laughs> I want to make sure I get all my words in, Deputy President Officer. I would give you an extra minute if you took an intervention. It's up to you. Oh, go on then. <laughs> Not very gracefully said, but there you are, Ms Martin. I'm grateful to the member for letting me give this intervention. Um, Mr Kerr will know that I used to work in one of the colleges that he is talking about, and of course he is a North East Scotland representative. Can I ask if you've actually visited North East Scotland College and asked directly um, the, the board or any of the staff of North East Scotland College about their feelings on the merger in our area. Mr Kerr. I thank Gillian Martin for the intervention. I thank the Deputy Presiding Officer for allowing me the opportunity to say, yes, I have. Uh, but Audit Scotland, the, the Government and the SFC points to savings of £50 million. But Audit Scotland's report of August 2016, Scotland's Colleges, which was also scrutinised at the Public Audit Committee, says the savings arose mainly from a real terms reduction in funding to the sector as a whole and not just merged colleges. Audit Scotland says it remains unclear how much of these savings are as a direct result of college mergers. The same report also raises very serious concerns regarding the SFC policy of cutting funding for part-time courses, 
Audit Scotland states this has led to a decrease of 53% in part-time female student numbers. It is this level of parliamentary scrutiny and openness that is mandated if Parliament and the people of Scotland are to have confidence in the system. Uh, I'd rather not, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, University of Scotland put it well in saying that the SFC should be, quote, an independent expert body at arm's length from the government that can develop detailed policy on how to support the sector's success with broad overall strategic guidance from government. But as Dr Kemp told Joanne Lamont in the Education Committee on the 16th of November, when we speak to ministers, we speak to them in private because that is the way to give advice. Are private discussions really how an arm's length organisation should operate? As Liz Smith pointed out at the same meeting, Audit Scotland are increasingly of the view that the long-term strategy of the SFC lacks transparency and sufficient scrutiny. Which leads neatly into the motion's focus on the Scottish Government's Enterprise and Skills Review. So many organisations, individuals and many in this chamber find the proposals outlined in phase one of the government's enterprise and skills review concerning, particularly in relation to the creation of a new super board. The government proposes they will create a new Scotland-wide statutory board to coordinate HIE and SE, including SDI, SDS and the SFC. The fact is that this proposal, possibly or maybe probably with a minister in the chair, will make the SFC more political, another arm of government accountable to government ministers. And this will have a detrimental impact on the vital academic independence of our universities and higher education establishments. No, I won't. In November, Universities Scotland rightly said this, we need to make sure universities are independent actors, that we are working in partnership with government, but we are still working as autonomous charities, that we are another force of initiative in society and not being brought into a directive relationship from the government. And what of the impact of the new super board? The Public Audit Committee was concerned to hear from Alistair Sim that the more we come into the sphere of influence of and direction from government, the higher the risk of being reclassified for ONS purposes, which means that we cannot earn entrepreneurial income or hold reserves. And leaving that aside, what would be the impact of being under the governance of a super board which has as its remit enterprise and skills rather than the full range of higher education institutions' missions? Presiding officer, in summary, the further and higher education fields are under immense strain. Audit Scotland have expressed concerns that the SFC's relationship with government lacks transparency. The Education Committee is concerned that too often decisions on the funding and future of our educational establishments are taken in private. The merging of colleges has led to a slashing of part-time courses having a detrimental impact on female students. And it remains unclear to the Public Audit Committee or Audit Scotland whether the apparent 50 million of savings promised due to mergers have been achieved because of the mergers or simply through budget cuts. But perhaps most troubling to anyone who believes in open and transparent governance for those that cherish the independence of academia is the blurring of the line between the arm's length SFC and the government and that the independence of our institutions may be put at risk through the proposals in the Enterprise and Skills Review. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Ross Greer. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I state for the record that I am an elected member in South Lanarkshire Council. I am pleased that Parliament is getting the chance to give closer scrutiny, again, twice in one day, to the important evidence that the committee has gathered during their pre-budget scrutiny sessions from the SQA, Education Scotland, SDS and the Scottish Funding Council. Some of the evidence that has been given to the committee during their recent sessions has been troubling. Concerns over the effectiveness of the SQA, alongside concerns about the role of Education Scotland and the Funding Council are deeply worrying, and it is imperative that Parliament takes this very seriously. We currently have an education system which is facing significant challenges, something borne out by the, the recent spate of, of damning statistics released over the past few months. And when our Scot Scottish Parliament's own cross-party Education Skills Committee is now also exploring key issues which question the very core, very core functions of the key education bodies which deliver and regulate the education system. It seems very clear to me that there are serious challenges here which must be addressed. Because the damning PISA statistics from last month tell us that after a, a decade of, of this administration, we have seen Scottish education 
go backwards with falling standards in, in reading, mathematics and science? Will the attainment gap between pupils from the richest backgrounds and those from the most deprived persists? Meanwhile, it is a fact that we have 4,000 fewer teachers than when the SNP came to power. The number of pupils with identified additional support needs has substantially increased, but the number of additional support need teachers is down 13% between 2010 and 2015, according to the Scottish Government's own statistics. All the I'll give way to Arbor the Minister. The member will know, because the argument has been well rehearsed in this chamber, that while additional support need teachers are indeed uh, trained to deal with pupils, for example, with autism, dyslexia, etc., the definition of additional support need was expanded to include, for example, periods of bereavement and other short-term measures which would require support above and beyond that which is normally delivered within the school setting. Therefore, the two are not necessarily directly analogous. Monica yeah. Lennon. Yeah, so the fact remains that we now have more information about the needs of children, but we're seeing a decline in yeah. support. And we have exactly. the children's charities tell Parliament exactly. and Government that they it's fear it's a, a lost fact. generation of opportunity for these young people. So I hope we can continue to debate that. I'll, I'll make some progress uh, if I may. Well, I will make way for Christina McKelvey. Christina McKelvey. I wonder if Councillor Lennon would tell us how many of those special educational need teachers were sacked for South Lanarkshire Council last year? Monica Lennon. It's the cut from the budget. Well, I really think Christina McKelvey needs to reflect on the comment that she has just made. I have never heard Christina McKelvey raise any concern about budget pressures facing South Lanarkshire Council. In fact, we hear from this side of the chamber that government, uh, uh, um, sorry, that the, the councils are receiving fair settlements, and I don't think what's happening in local government and local communities is at all fair. But Christina McKelvey can perhaps clarify her position at another opportunity. Cutting resources means that hardworking teachers are forced to pick up the extra workload, putting the sector under ever-increasing strain, and meaning that the educational experience of our young people ultimately suffers as a result. The teachers' admissions to the committee regarding the SQA show beyond doubt that the authority and this government have lost the full confidence of teachers. When teachers are expressing experiences of the SQA, SQA as to quote some of the submissions, entirely negative, hugely inconsistent and not fit for purpose, it is clear there is a serious problem. Others may choose to ignore that. <laughs> and rather than addressing these very real problems, the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary for Education, I fear, is looking in the wrong place for solutions to yeah. these challenges. The School Governance Review puts the emphasis on reforming where power for school lies in a misguided attempt to restructure local government responsibility for education that will only risk creating yet more layers of bureaucracy and confusion for parents and pupils and will do little to affect outcomes. What our education system needs is more resources. Yeah. That means more teachers and more support staff so that our children have the support they need to succeed. That means using the powers of this parliament to invest in our schools and protect education budgets, not rush into wrong-headed reforms. The government should listen to the experts on its education governance review. The Scottish Parent Teacher Council are right to raise concerns about how accessible this review actually was to parents that the majority of its respondents actually skipped a question about the governance review itself is telling. It highlights where the real priorities of parents lie and should be a signal to the government that it is currently focusing its attention in the wrong place. As Daniel Johnson has said, Children in Scotland were also amongst the latest organisations this week to question the plans by raising concerns that the current form of proposals for governance reform will have virtually zero impact on educational attainment. The view from parents, from teachers and from education professionals across the sector is clear. Lack of proper resource, not school governance, is where the problem lies. I personally find it concerning and perhaps telling that there is a common thread of critique about miscommunication and complex, inaccessible information from both teachers and parents across the education system, whether that be from the experience of dealing with the SQA documentation or attempting to access the governance review. We must remember that the most important thing about this debate is improving outcomes for our children. That is something we can all agree on, even though we may disagree on the best way to go about it. 
Behind statistics about cuts to staff numbers, cuts to support staff and, failing atta or fall and falling attainment are real individual experiences of teachers under pressure and pupils who are not getting the experiences they deserve or the support they need to fulfil their potential. To close the attainment gap and tackle inequality, then I believe we also need to take a broad view of what support our education system can offer to pupils. A fully rounded education that has to be more than just attainment, as important as that is. In closing, it must also be about ensuring our children have a rounded experience and that their health and emotional well-being are considered. Counselors in every school would be a huge step in the right direction. To close, I believe we need to take a whole system review with regards to improving the educational experience of our young people. And going forward, that should be included in any considerations for what the role and functions of our education bodies are or should be. Thank you. Thank you, Ross Greer, to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are two key issues that have arisen out of the Committee's scrutiny of education agencies and uh, enterprise agencies that I would like to raise today. The proposed new super board that would replace the boards of the Scottish Funding Council, Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Enterprise and HIE, and the performance of the SQA and the breakdown of teachers' trust in the authority. I'm disappointed that the Scottish Government has insisted on pushing ahead with its centralisation agenda, despite concerns raised across the political spectrum by local authorities, by our partners in education and by experts such as the Royal Society of Edinburgh. The Government has insisted that the review of enterprise and skills is premised on evidence and focused towards a step change. The proposed new super board meets neither of these principles. There is little evidence to support the idea of a new super board replacing the existing boards for the education and enterprise agencies, something that the Education and Skills Committee has been acutely aware of. We asked uh, Keith Brown to produce this evidence. He highlighted four submissions out of over 300 uh, responses to our call for evidence. Yet, upon inspection, these submissions do not actually call for the existing boards to be abolished. They call for clarity and consistency in the direction of Scotland's economic strategy, a concern I'm sure we all share, and they highlight the potential for a Scotland-wide strategic board. But they do not call for the existing boards to be abolished. In the case of the Funding Council, the committees had much discussion on the fact that the board of the Scottish Funding Council is the Scottish Funding Council. It appears that the Cabinet Secretary has been rather liberal in his interpretation of the evidence provided, interpreting legitimate concerns over the complexity of existing structures as an endorsement of the SNP's push for centralisation and closer government control. The evidence, in fact, seems to me at least to suggest the opposite. Concerns and opposition to the government's super board plans. The Royal Society of Edinburgh, Universities and Colleges Union, the NUS, University of Scotland have all raised concerns about the independence of the Scottish Funding Council following the creation of a super board. The proposed board also goes beyond the step change remit of the Governance Review. The Government has so far refused to rule out that the new board be chaired by a minister a step that would significantly enhance government control over these agencies, potentially ending their status as arm's length bodies. Such a move would also severely endanger the independence of Scotland's universities, which is absolutely vital to their world-class competitiveness and their ability to attract funding. Both the cabinet secretaries... Yes. Shirley Ann Somerville. And I reassure him and uh, Liam Kerr, who didn't give me the opportunity to do this earlier, that the government will do nothing to jeopardise the independence of the higher education institutions or indeed the re reclassification with ONS. We are absolutely categorical in that and have said so to University of Scotland. Ross Greer. Thank you very much. The Minister actually raises an issue that I'm just about to come to in that the government seems to have reached a conclusion and will now assess how it can make that conclusion work, despite the fact that it's not actually assessed what the effects will be. Both the Cabinet Secretaries for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work and Education and Skills in their appearances before our committee were unable to provide anything approaching evidence of the effect the Super Board proposal could have on research funding as an example, and there's significant concern about the risk of reclassification as public bodies, as the Minister has mentioned. But I've been left with the distinct impression that regardless of the conclusions, which I feel are misguided, this process has been flawed in the extreme. 
The government seems to have reached a conclusion, one I expect it would have reached regardless of the evidence submitted, has decided unequivocally to press ahead with that conclusion and will only now assess what the impact is. In phase one, a conclusion was reached, and in phase two, they're going to assess what the impact of it is. That's not the right way to do this. It's not evidence-based policy making. It's not acceptable. There are further concerns about the suitability of a super board tasked with, according to the government, bringing greater integration and focus to the delivery of enterprise and skills that would be overseeing further and higher education funding. Scotland's colleges and universities are certainly important to the skills of the nation, but they are also much more than that, and the agencies involved in these proposals have remits far beyond enterprise and skills alone. Education and research is a goal in itself. The freedom to pursue lines of inquiry, even where they do not appear to directly contribute towards economic development, is absolutely vital to the freedom of our universities. None of us question that. Many of humanity's greatest discoveries have occurred quite by accident. After all, Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin this way during his research at St Mary's Hospital. Our funding for colleges and universities cannot be dictated to, diluted by, or have its focus taken away because of a focus on enterprise and skills goals. I would ask for assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that it will rethink the Government's proposal to uh, abolish the existing boards and at the very least ensure some level of independence for our universities by guaranteeing that any new super board will not be chaired by a minister. In the committee's scrutiny of the education agencies, it has become increasingly apparent that an alarming breakdown in trust has occurred between the SQA and the teachers that it works with but crucially that the SQE does not seem to recognise this breakdown in trust. The development of new qualifications under the Curriculum for Excellence has contributed to unsustainable workloads and a lack of clarity for both teachers and pupils. And I appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary recognises this and has been working towards a workload reduction. But we have seen issues. Exam scripts have been used which have contained significant errors discussed in this Parliament, while other exams have seen a significant variation in the quality of their marking. It is apparent that teachers do not always feel comfortable openly raising and discussing the problems facing the SQA and the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. The convener mentioned the value of the anonymous submissions that we received. The fact that we received so many submissions from so many teachers with such consistency was both informative and deeply alarming, as was the discussion the convener and I hosted with a group of primary and secondary teachers here in the Parliament. It's unlike any other evidence that I've seen in my short time in this parliament. We need to consider how to improve oversight of the SQA and repair the trust with teachers. The Scottish Government should consider proposals made by the EIS for greater teacher representation, including on the boards of education agencies, particularly the SQA. The Scottish, uh, Scottish education has a world-renowned reputation, but we know that while staff and students put in incredible effort, something isn't working at present. In reviewing these four agencies, the committee has uncovered a number of areas where clear improvements can be made and where the Scottish Government's current efforts are perhaps misguided. I hope that the Government will carefully consider them. Tavish Scott to be followed by Gillian Martin. Very much, Presiding Officer. I must say, uh, on Ross Gear's central point about evidence, it does strike me there's a slight disconnect between the argument which says that uh, there is no evidence in relation to the proposal for a super board and the abolition of the other boards, uh, not the principle that the Minister earlier outlined, but the argument that Ross Gear made, and those who've also been arguing that there's something slightly wrong with the number of representations the committee had on from teachers, and whether that really reflected teacher um, views and teachers' concerns about the SQA and uh, some of our other bodies. I, I simply say we can't have it both ways. Um, uh, there's evidence to a committee and there's not evidence that, wasn't the, the, that failed to be presented in relation to the super boards. And I just want the government to at least reflect on that at some point in, this, in the phase two considerations of this matter, because they haven't taken Parliament with them on that. Presiding officer, can I, I, I wanted to address a, a slightly wider remark today, but could I firstly apologise to you and to the Chamber for having to leave early today. Um, the weather is such that I'm going to try and catch an early flight to somewhere else, so snow may stop uh, that, but also want to thank James Dornan for the careful and indeed cheerful way in which he um, uh, convenes the uh, Education and Skills Committee. Not an easy task given the varied quality of the members on, uh, uh, on it, uh, and I very much include myself in that. Um, but what I wanted to do was very, very uh, cent uh, centrally address the point that the Cabinet Secretary made in his opening uh, remarks, because he was right about teachers being at the core uh, of this uh, debate, that the biggest 
educational challenge we have, as Liz Smith and as Daniel Johnson also put it too, is around the implementation of curriculum for excellence, and that the concern that we have established as a committee and one's views about the level of that concern, of course, are, 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 are open to interpretation, is about how that was implemented, and cr crucially, the role of the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board, which of course includes the SQA, the uh, Education Scotland, yes, local government, uh, COSLA and local authorities, and is of course chaired by the government. Now, as the convener said, we are taking further evidence on that in due course. But any objective assessment of the evidence that we've already got uh, by the government or by anyone else from outside uh, has to say that something has not worked there. Otherwise, the Royal Society of Edinburgh would not say in their submission for today's debate that, in our view, coherent strategic leadership, especially at an educational professional level, has been virtually non-existent and implementation of curriculum for excellence has suffered profoundly from an adequate action having been, given to, having, uh, having been given to how change should be managed. Now, even if they're half right, even if they're a quarter right, uh, presiding officer, and maybe they're overdoing it, that is a profound finding about what has been going on these past nine years. And I do think that the government must reflect on that in, uh, in the governance review that is uh, now under uh, way. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, rightly set out uh, some changes that had taken place um, in relation to Scottish education and performance, uh, but he also has to reflect, and he did, um, the, PISA, uh, report, the PISA findings and also the new focus, and it is a new focus, on literacy and numeracy by uh, him and his government. Now, I think they're right to do that, but if nothing else, it is an admission that not all has been well and that the implementation of curriculum for excellence uh, has not gone uh, as it should have done. And I think that does mean that we do need to ask some fundamental questions about, uh, in particular, Education Scotland and the structure of Education uh, Scotland. Now, the OECD report, which the Cabinet Secretary cited, also said some fairly damning things about Education Scotland in terms of its implementation. It said at page 44, about the comprehensibility of CFE. This is, an, again, in the context of Education Scotland. It described a scattergun approach to strategic planning at page 77, and it called on the, cited the need for simplifying the simplification process, if that's not an oxy oxymoron, on page 109. So there are some fundamental questions about the effectiveness of Education Scotland. And just, uh, and just uh, now, uh, the uh, study into the employees' views of that organisation have been uh, published. And I thought the most damning one was its performance, so Education Scotland's performance, in the key category of managing change, which is what this has all been about, is woeful. Only 11% of Education Scotland's own employees in this last year, 2016, think change is well managed by Education Scotland. Well, now, were, if, were the Education Secretary uh, or were a local authority leader to find a school um, with those kind of uh, results, then the, the demand for change would be, would be very clear. The head teacher would probably be find, looking for a new uh, position, or there'd certainly be lots of continuous professional development, or so on and so uh, forth. So I just suggest to the Cabinet Secretary and his colleagues that uh, we cannot ignore the reality of what has happened and the need for some change. And the change that I would advocate uh, is very simple. I, do, I strongly believe that Education Scotland should be split in its two, into its two respective functions. One, the inspection of not just schools, but of course uh, other parts of the educational um uh, regime. Uh, I think that is a profoundly different function from that of policy guidance, uh, both to ministers, which of course Education Scotland must conduct, and actually to, to say to Liam Kerr, uh, some of that does need to be in private. I take the point that Mr Kerr has taken, but actually, of course, the Education Scotland should brief any Cabinet Secretary in private. But, but that is a very different function from the inspection regime, and the two are quite uh, separate, uh, if I may be so uh, bold. On the SQA uh, Deputy Presi Presiding Officer, um, there has been a range of evidence uh, provided by my colleagues across the committee uh, this, this afternoon. But it seems to me that the challenge function, uh, the ability to look at how the SQA has coordinated its activities on exams and on the design of exams and on the assessment process uh, with Education Scotland and with the other parts of that management board just has not worked. It is difficult not to come to that conclusion in the first instance. And I hope that the government again will reflect on that and uh, find a way in which uh, that management board uh, actually starts to bring those organisations not just round a table because by definition they have been doing that but actually to concentrate 
debate on what needs to happen uh, to make the lives of our teachers and the ability of our teachers to teach successfully uh, much more powerful and much more straightforward. The final point I want to make is on the Scottish Funding uh, Council. Um, others, uh, Ross Greer, Liz Smith and, and uh, Daniel Johnson, amongst others, have made the case for leaving that organisation uh, well alone. And I actually believe the government when they say they don't want to interfere with the independence of higher education institutions or the university sector more broadly, but therefore they should do the sensible thing and the logical thing from that position, and that is leave that board alone. Alice Brown and her board provide the very challenge function to the executive team, to the chief executive that is needed. It should stay that way, and I urge the government to take exactly that step. Thank you. Thank you. Gillian Martin to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. The profession with responsibility for our country's teaching and learning is one of the best and most important professions out there. It's the career that I previously chose as a college lecturer and it's the career my husband chose as a secondary school teacher. I know how hard those on the ground have worked to get the curriculum for excellence implemented over the years. And if I forget, my husband will surely remind me. And indeed, the Cabinet Secretary rightly points out the curriculum for excellence is a collaborative enterprise between teachers, local authorities and all the various agencies. Scrutiny of our education system from the confines of a committee room in Parliament has been a challenge for me, I'm going to be honest, uh, particularly given my knowledge of the tremendous work that's going on in the schools and colleges that I know from personal experience. And I'm always mindful of this when levelling any criticism. Um, I have to say I find it quite distressing today to hear Willie Rennie, FMQs today, say the phrase, our schools are failing, particularly when we had pupils and teachers from Balweary School in Kirkcaldy one of the top performing schools in Scotland sitting in the public gallery. Our schools are not failing. But <laughs> let's never lump the whole school system in with any comments that we've got on individual agencies, which I say are valid. Those comments are absolutely valid. But when you say that phrase, think about how that is received out there in our schools. I got a text later on from somebody that was watching this in their lunch hour saying cheers Willie and from a teacher who's a friend of mine. How does that make them feel? An education system however must always be in development to apply to changing times and that's why we must always reach out to practitioners to see where it can be improved and it's noted that we're just at the end of the first whole cycle of the new system. My son left six year last year and it's a, product, a living, breathing product of the first cycle of Curriculum for Excellence. And I think the curriculum has worked well for him. The whole person approach, the broad curricular approach, allowed my son, who I don't think he would mind me saying, is not particularly academic in the traditional bookish sense, but is driven in other ways, to find out what he was good at and equipped him with skills that I see him using at college. A college that Mr. Kerr, I mentioned to Mr. Kerr, um, and is a top performing Scottish college. Um, this may, might be a good point for Mr. Kerr maybe to intervene in me and give me more detail in the, the, com the conversations that he's had with my former colleagues on what they think about the merger process. Um, no, okay. In fact, uh, my son's experience, if I can use it as an example, is not does not equate with the bad press that the education system is having over the last couple of months. Um, in fact, let's put that bad press into perspective. More school leavers are reaching positive destinations than ever before. Higher pass rates last year were very high and college and university applications are at an all-time high. And this week we heard from the IPPR that youth unemployment is at its lowest level since 2001 and is consistently lower than the overall UK rate of unemployment. And the Cabinet Secretary, the Cabinet Secretary outlined an awful lot more. Modern apprenticeships are providing positive destinations all over Scotland and industry is getting more involved in learning. And colleges are rightly focusing on courses that lead to employment. We just nail this part-time course thing for once and for all. I doubt I will be able to because I feel like I'm on my feet defending it every single week. I will not accept the worm war lines from both opposition uh, benches that part-time courses are, uh, the, the, the levels of part-time courses are now at the detriment of people's education. We have, got now, we have got now got more people going into work as a result of their experiences in colleges. The work of SDS and early intervention to identify pupils who may not reach a positive destination is crucial. And a refocusing on achievement, not just aligned with academia, but recognising the diversity of skills that children have an aptitude for and which have career opportunities that will benefit our society and economy as a whole, 
I know through some of the, the I, I know though that some of the chambers of commerce and economic development ages, agencies urged SDS to be more mindful of diversity and to adapt to local needs, particularly in rural areas. And the report on the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce cited gender stereotyping as an issue and wanted to see improvements on the involvement of BME, disabled and care-leaving young people in modern apprenticeships. In the committee on the 9th of November, I highlighted to SDS the issue of involving more small to medium-sized businesses in modern apprenticeships, which is a concern that's been raised to me. In reaching out to stakeholders, we've seen quite consistent issues with the education agencies, that's true. Teachers pointed to things that hindered rather than helped them. Still, the SQA are struggling to rein in the copious amount of guidance materials which we were told were often impenetrable and used confusing and contradictory language. Serious instances of lack of consistency between the curriculum guidance and exam papers are well documented and are simply unacceptable. The inspection system at Education Scotland also came in for some criticism. Teachers told us of the stress and the pointlessness of working evenings and weekends to print off evidence and documents for the inspection. Education Scotland assured us that they were working hard to change inspection and my exchange with Alistair Delaney of Education Scotland on the 3rd of November outlines the commitments made by them in this regard and I've seen evidence of this work. I recently visited a primary school in my constituency that did not do well in a stressful inspection year, years ago and staff morale had been low as a result. They were recently re-inspected and the head teacher told me that this inspection was an entirely new experience for the school, a positive experience. It focused, focused on support rather than judgment, on teaching and learning rather than paperwork, on professional development and ideas rather than box ticking. And I want to congratulate Newbury Mayor's Primary on how they've turned their inspection report into one they can justifiably be very proud of. The inspection culture change Mr. isn't complete though. Inclusion. Isn't complete though, and that's evident from responses to our consultation. I just want to say in closing, the implementation and development of our curriculum is a work in progress. The committee have identified where more work is urgently required and the agencies in front of us have been left in no doubt as to where our correspondents think their attention should be focused. Thank you very much. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I also, um, like other members, welcome uh, Mr Bay and thank uh, the convener uh, for bringing it to the chamber this afternoon. Uh, I'm not a member of the committee. Um, I come as a local councillor and as a parent, and as I waded through the different reports over the last couple of evenings, I come with an interest to see where we are particularly in regard to Education Scotland. I'm sure like uh, most members on the 1st of January as you uh, woke up with a clear head, you reviewed the previous year and then looked forward to making resolutions uh, for the year ahead. And I think the same could be said as we start a, a new year to look at Education Scotland. This is a good time to review its function and operation, to see what is working and to see what needs to change. The first function of Education Scotland is to develop policy. But it's interesting, the evidence given to the committee by teachers is that it is failing in this role and teachers are confused and simply do not understand what is put before them. There was, uh, when evidence was being taken by the committee, 20,000 pages on their website. Now, if you are a local primary school teacher or secondary school teacher trying to find information in a busy life, how is that meant to yeah. happen? Now, I accept it is being reduced, but we've got to ask the question, how did we get to that situation in the first place? Who allowed that? And who had been monitoring it and scrutinizing it to say, actually, this is simply not acceptable? Yeah. But if it's there to develop policy, it's certainly there to do quality assurance. It's there to scrutinise what is going on. And I think this comes to a very interesting question, a question that politicians, all of us, have to look at. Is Education Scotland there fundamentally to help and support teachers, or is it there as an arm of Scottish Government? 
And again, Scottish Government might be clear on that, but I don't think teachers and those that gave evidence to the committee are. It is very difficult to be judge and jury. I would love to have gone to university, sat my paper, and then marked it myself, <laughs> but that would be unacceptable. But yet that is what we're asking Education Scotland to do. We are saying, you put up, you put the guidelines up. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Balfour, because I think this gets to the number one of the key points. That is precisely not what Education Scotland has been asked to do. Education Scotland, yes, supports the development and the delivery of policy within communities, but then inspects the delivery by schools of that policy. It doesn't judge itself. It's not judging you of itself. It's judging the implementation of agreed policy by individual schools to help drive improvement in education. And that's the fundamental error that's at the heart of Mr Balfour's argument. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Mr General. I, I mean, I thank the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for his intervention. I mean, I suppose to respond to that briefly is that that may well be his understanding, but it's not the understanding that came out clearly in the evidence. And secondly, if that is the case, why are we think of only one of four countries in the whole of the world that have this particular system? Almost every other country across the world has two bodies doing two separate functions. And my question to the Cabinet Secretary is, why do we not have it here? The third issue I think is very important to raise is that is the decline in inspections. Uh, whatever the figures, and I have to say I gave up in the end trying to work out what the numbers exactly were, but what is clear that the number of inspections that happened in our schools today is less than what's happening in 2010? Julian Martin. It's not necessarily it correlates that the inspections being, if there are less inspections, that the quality of inspections is actually improving. And there don't have to be lots of inspections. In fact, they're very time consuming for teachers um, to undertake. Jeremy Balfour. No, I accept the point, but my point being, Fewer children are known and fewer parents are known. Are their schools acceptable or not if there are fewer inspections? I totally accept, but it doesn't deal with the quality. That is a separate issue. All I'm saying is that less schools in Scotland are being inspected now. And thus, if you live in a certain area, you do not know how well that school is being, is being going on. And I would have thought, as we implement, and as a curriculum for excellence has been implemented across Scotland over these last year, there would be actually more need for inspection, less need. But yet there is no evaluation at all going on, as far as I can see, in regard to curriculum of excellence. And before anyone jumps up from the government benches, no, we're not against curriculum for excellence. But we are asking, why has no minister... <laughs> Okay, Mr Balfour has been extremely generous in his interventions today um, and I'm conscious I'm popping up from the government benches <laughs> but the government invited the OECD to evaluate curriculum for excellence that was what we invited the OECD to come in to do so that's been done by the OECD we couldn't have been more open about that point Jeremy Balfour but it's not but, it's but it's not the baseline and what has come out from that and from the PISA results is that we do not have a good system working at the moment, and yet nothing has been done about it. The final issue, and hopefully I can get through this very briefly, presiding officer, is in regard to subject choice. A number of parents have contacted me in regard to this, particularly here within Edinburgh Malovians. They feel that their children are being pushed down paths too early that they simply do not want to go. That there's a lack of choice in regard to, regard to choosing subjects. And too quickly, people are not being allowed to do subjects that they want to study, depending on what the school or what region we live in in Scotland. We are ending up, if we're not careful, not only a lottery in regard to region, but actually a lottery depending on which catchment area you go to within a certain city, town, village or area. My time is gone, and so I cannot answer the many questions I have asked. But these are questions that we do need to come to. Why? Not just so that we can scrutinise government agencies and fill in two or three hours of parliamentary time, but something far more important than that. If we do not get it right for our parents, for our pupils, for our teachers, we will be failing not only a generation, 
but we will be failing Scotland as we go forward into the 21st century. And my fear, presiding officer, is that education in Scotland is simply not doing what it should be doing. Thank you. Uh, Colin Beattie to be followed by Jenny Mara. I would ask all members, Jeremy Balfour took a number of interventions, I would try, ask all members to be tight to six minutes if they can. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, as a member of the Education and Culture Committee in the last parliamentary session and of the Education and Skills Committee in this session, I am very pleased to have the opportunity to speak on this motion today. And as you have noted from the motion and the convener's opening speech, part of the committee's recent remit has focused on scrutiny and evidence gathering on the roles of four national organisations, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, Education Scotland, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. And the questions that the committee secured answers to were, are their core functions correct or are there alternative approaches? Are these bodies delivering on their core functions? Should the roles of these organisations or their structures change as a result of the governance review or the enterprise and skills review? Can they demonstrate that, that performance, including reflecting best use of taxpayers' money? Are they sufficiently mindful of equalities when delivering their functions? Are these bodies sufficiently independent of government, acting as a sufficient advisory and challenge function to government? Do these bodies respond effectively to the needs of stakeholders and to constructive advice? Now, it's clear to me and I hope to my colleagues that the process involved is both rigorous and effective in identifying the present situation within each organisation. And in particular, the process allowed a wide range of stakeholders to express their opinions. And to allow for a maximum range of opinion, the evidence gathering took on a range of forms. The online surveys that ran from 2nd October to 1st November provided a total of 1,171 responses from teachers and lecturers through to parents and pupils. And these surveys were widely disseminated through social media, as well as the Parliament's Education Services newsletter, the latter being widely read by teachers. Beyond this, the surveys were also sent to political correspondents at major Scottish media and educational establishments. And the success of these methods is evidenced by the substantial range and number of responses. Evidence was also gathered in person when the committee held an informal meeting with teachers. And this was built upon when the committee members individually arranged to visit a local educational establishment to speak directly with stakeholders. And in my case, I visited New Battle High School in Dalkeith. I was keen to canvass the thoughts of the teachers here as the school is located in the catchment areas for three of the most socially deprived areas in Scotland. Around 69% of pupils at the school are sourced from areas of multiple deprivation. And the staff and teachers at New Battle High do incredibly well under these circumstances. And in meeting with them, I was able to understand firsthand if our local and national institutions were providing the required amount of support and guidance. And to feed this back directly to the Education Committee. Returning to the surveys, these included questions designed to reflect how each organisation contributed to a range of the Scottish Government's national outcomes. And while some of the surveys had fewer participants than others, 646 for the SQA compared to 83 for colleges and universities, the responses were enlightening and displayed clear mismatches in understanding and respect to the work of each organisation. In the case of the national outcome, and I quote, our young people are more successful learners, confident individuals, effective contributors and responsible citizens, the colleges and universities were thought to make a valuable contribution with almost half of respondents saying they contributed a good deal. The modern apprenticeship scheme was also valued with roughly a third of respondents rating its contributions similarly. Conversely, Education Scotland was highlighted as an organisation that did not contribute as well to the national outcomes listed in the survey. In the case of, the, of that out, above out, outcome, 62% of respondents felt Education Scotland's guidance and support contributed either a little or not at all, while 63 responded with similar answers for Education Scotland's inspections. These responses were also broadly similar to those for Education Scotland regarding the second national outcome in the survey, and I quote, we're better educated, more skilled, and more successful, renowned for our research and innovation. The surveys and evidence gathered also shed light on a range of issues surrounding the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Generally, participants were on the fence when responding to the above queries on outcomes. However, over two thirds of respondents disagreed with the SQA's value statement, I quote, our customers and users trust us to get it right for them. There's clearly an issue here between how the SQA perceives itself and how its work is regarded by end users. And even though it's a valued organization, 
Almost three quarters of survey participants agreed that SQA qualifications enabled learners to access and progress with further and higher education. And the survey picked up a variety of main issues on the SQA, including that its documentation is unclear, its assessment standards not well understood, marking inconsistent, and simply there are too many changes. Some of the anonymous submissions stated that, and I quote, SQA has not been able to communi communicate information in a clear, concise manner. There have been so many mistakes that we no longer trust anything that comes from them. SQA has lost the respect and trust of Scottish teachers, and perhaps most pertinently, I cannot communicate strongly enough how discouraging it is to see keen, talented, hardworking pupils walk away from my subject with a C when they deserved an A or decide not to continue with art because they cannot deal with the physical workload. These opinions were reinforced in my own discussions at New Battle High School, and here the teachers stated that in recent years, qualifications and assessments have been dictating the curriculum, and in particular, what teachers concentrated on delivering in the classroom to get pupils through examinations. Can you President close, officer, please, Mr. Beattie? Presiding officer, my, my thanks go to all respondents for their participation and also to the committee clerks for their hard work. I look forward to being part of the next steps as the committee takes this forward, as well as seeing how this work will inform the roles of other committees. I now call Jenny Mara to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm not a member of the Education uh, Committee this session, um, so I've not been privy to um, all the evidence sessions, but um, I want to offer uh, my reflections on something that, that is very close to my heart, and I thank the committee for this important scrutiny that they are doing. I, mean, I was extremely worried listening to the opening speeches from the convener, from Mr Swinney, from Liz Smith and Daniel Johnson, about the confusion and lack of confidence in our key education agencies. And I think this is something that we should all uh, legitimately be very concerned about. Because we don't have to look that far back, uh, presiding officer, to remember a time when the SQA was seen as a real hallmark in Scotland, a real benchmarking institution of uh, rigorous standards, or I like to think it was so when, when I passed my hires, but I think it was generally um, thought of as such. Now, the SQA has not been without its problems since devolution under different governments, but the lack of confidence among teachers that the convener of the Education Committee, James Dorman, outlined today in the SQA is of real concern to me, and I think of real concern to every member of this chamber and parents across the country. Of more an acute concern to me is how this is contributing to education in every school in this country and the performance generally of education, which is the lifeline of opportunities in our communities. Presiding officer, it was with great sadness and a bit of despair that I read the PISA results at the end of last year. And the subsequent statistics released by the Scottish Government on the 13th of December caused me and I know many colleagues uh, further grave concern and confusion. If I may make two points on this, Deputy Presiding Officer. Liz Smith outlined concerns about the rigour of data, and I think she was referring to Education Scotland and SQA. I was confused and perplexed by this data released on the 13th of December, as I think many colleagues and journalists and, and many other people were. Let me give an example. Pupils at Fintray Primary School in Dundee, 20 to 30 per cent of them achieved the expected levels of writing at primary school. But by the time they reached secondary school, their writing achievement levels had shot up to 90%. Now, even council officials in Dundee have indicated to me that these statistics should be taken with a pinch of salt, which leads me to ask of the efficacy of this work and if it is just an experiment, how this will uh, improve. But of graver concern to me than the bare statistics is that it was another clear indicator that our education system is struggling more than it used to. The PISA and the 13th of December statistics represent a trend in the wrong direction. And the more statistics we have monitoring this trend, the less we can ignore it or be complacent. 
On the 13th of December, I was reflecting on these statistics, presiding officer, and my mind wound back to a discussion I took part in at Dundee University during the Scottish referendum debate. If you'll excuse me making a political a point in this committee debate, presiding officer, I said during that debate back in the referendum that we should be concentrating our political energies on domestic concerns like education, because education in Scotland was not as good as it used to be. Shona Robison immediately dismissed my concerns as talking Scotland down. But I note now that this stuff has come home to roost, and especially since PISA, that the Scottish Government has had to wake up to these realities and the funding decisions that are being made. Presiding Officer, Dundee City Council will have to make budget cuts of £12.5 million in February after paring budgets back year after year. Teachers in attainment schools in Dundee tell me that they don't know how they can be expected to raise attainment when classroom assistants have gone from their very classrooms, when all the early year practitioners trained in literacy support were stripped out of these schools in deprived areas to cover the government's childcare hours commitments in nurseries when Dundee has seen a 28% reduction in additional support needs teachers, twice the national reduction. And when, to my confusion, none, not one penny, of the 4.8 million attainment money allocated dun to Dundee has been spent on additional specialist teachers in literacy and numeracy. Instead, a handful of modern apprentices have been employed but I'm not really sure what qualifications young modern apprentices have in raising attainment and raising standards of literacy and numeracy in our schools. The new secondary school building in Dundee Harris Academy, opened by Mr Swinney in December, is already scores of children over capacity and overcrowded after the SNP closed and merged Menas Hill High School last year. Presiding officer, I wish the Education Committee all the best with their scrutiny of a critical issue for the future of Scotland. Shedding light on the efficacy of the SQA and Education Scotland must bear fruit for our pupils in our schools across this country and seek to reverse the downward trend that the statistics report. Thank you. I call Richard Lockhead to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I begin by congratulating, as a member of the committee, our convener, James Dornan, on summarising very well in his opening speech the issues arose out of the evidence we took from uh, the agencies. In my few short months as a member of that committee, I have been struck by the myriad of factors that impact on the ability of children in Scotland to learn and the quality of education that's delivered in their schools and universities and colleges and through the other agendas as well, and they are enormously complex. But today, of course, the focus is on the agencies and the role they play, and I will refer to many of the issues that arose out of taking evidence in SQA and Education Scotland. But it is worth saying at the outset that education is about a lot more than agencies. I think Gillian Martin touched on a very important point in that regard. I recently visited Speyside High School in my constituency and Keith Grammar School, and I've visited many schools over the years, as many other members have. When I go in, when I speak to the teachers, when I speak to the other staff, when I speak to the pupils, we talk about the future of education. They don't say to me, scrap the SQA, scrap Education Scotland. We talk about many of the wider issues in our society in Scotland and the impact they're having on our children to learn. We talk about the children who are coming to school with empty stomachs. How can they have a proper ability to learn? We talk about the chaotic lifestyles many of our families have in this country and the impact that has. Yes, of course, they talk about the issues that can be linked to the performance of the agencies, like teachers' workload, which I'll come on to, but we have to recognise that the agencies are just one small part of a wider jigsaw, and we have to ensure that we keep the other uh, issues in focus uh, as well. This debate, of course, is focusing on the results we got from the survey of 211 teachers out of 50,000 working in Scotland, and it's also important that we keep that in perspective. Again, that's not to demean the concerns expressed by the 211 teachers, because any of us who have been in this parliament know from speaking to constituents and visiting schools that the burden on teachers, the teachers' workloads, some of the other issues we're discussing today are 
common concerns from teachers right across Scotland and many of the 50,000, not just the 211. But we must keep that statistic in perspective uh, as well. I, of course, was a member of Parliament between 1999 and 2007, as was the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. And as an opposition member, I regularly raised the issue of teachers' workload with the then education ministers. So this is not a new issue, and many of the issues we're discussing today are not new issues. But they are now the subject of a new focus because of some of the statistics about the direction education Scotland's taking, some of the global statistics that members have highlighted. So it's now a golden opportunity to address some of these issues, and that's why I welcome the fact that the Education Secretary has given such a focus uh, to doing that. Now, our agencies, of course, have had to cope with the implementation of the Curriculum for Excellence over the last few years. That's soaked up a huge amount of time and energy. And now we have the Scottish Government's welcome commitment to close the attainment gap over the course of this Parliament. And I should say the very bold commitment to close the attainment gap over the course of this uh, Parliament. And as I said before, the agencies alone cannot close that gap. We can't have too much of a focus just in our schools when we have that debate. We have to look at those factors in wider society that I was referring to. And when I speak to some of the educationalists, as I have been doing just today actually, uh, they again reiterate that we have to look at preschool education and the ability of our pupils to learn when they come into P1. Uh, so it's not just simply about a primary school education system or secondary school education. This is part of a much wider uh, debate. So local authorities, Scottish Government, our leadership in schools, uh, Parliament, we've all got to work together to address these big challenges. But in terms of some of the real issues that did come to the committee's attention, which we identified from the SQA and Education Scotland evidence, the issues of the complexity of guidance, eh, the lack of clarity, the constant changes, the constant revisions, uh, and the burden that, that puts on teachers' ability to teach are very, very real issues that do have to be addressed. We did get some commitments from the agencies. They are being addressed. That's most welcome. We know the Cabinet Secretary and the Government are determined to address those issues as well, and that's really important as well. We also have to address the jargon. One of the big issues is ensuring this is not just a debate in this chamber amongst MSPs, it's a debate that people of Scotland understand, particularly parents and pupils, and as well as teachers, of course, and everyone else with a direct interest. And we can't have that transparency and openness if we concentrate on so much jargon, and we have to move away from it. I learned in the committee what ease no stands for, which is experience and outcomes for the purposes of the official report. It's not the song by Ellie King, the X's and O's, which is a song I've been listening to recently and which I keep getting wrong because of the E's and O's phrase that's used in the education committee far too often. And Janet Brown, when she came to appear before the committee in answer to one of her questions, spoke about associated personalised areas. I still don't know what that means. And, you know, it's really important the leaders of our agencies, and I'm not picking uh, on the SQA or Education Scotland, but the leaders of all our agencies with our role in this, speak in language that people can understand, uh, as well as MSPs and the politicians and the government uh, as well. In the last minute, I just want to address the teacher crisis uh, in Murray, because we have a shortage of teachers, and this is going to affect the ability to close the attainment gap. I've been told today that tomorrow there's going to be 23 adverts placed in the press for, for teachers to work in Murray, but overall there's 33 vacancies, and that's causing big problems in our schools in Murray, and indeed in other cities, or other places, even some of our cities, but mainly particularly rural areas. So workforce planning is really important. I welcome the steps the government are taking to address that. But clearly this puts an extra burden and workload on the remaining teachers in our schools who are having to carry more of a burden given the number of eight vacancies. Uh, and also this is going to potentially affect the ability of some subjects to be taught from August 2017 onwards. So I urge the Cabinet Secretary to continue to speak to Murray Council and other local authorities affected because this is a matter of now um, urgency that has to be addressed. But I thank the committee and my colleagues for all the work Please, they've Mr. done Lockhead, to highlight many of these important up. issues and I wish the Cabinet Secretary well in the future in grasping what's a big issue for the future of Scotland. Uh, now, the last two speakers are going to have to be very, very tight in timing. Uh, can I have Jenny or Ruth followed by Jamie Green, please? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start by reminding the Chamber that I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Education. Uh, and I must also declare an interest uh, as a former marker for standard grade and higher modern studies, respectively, at the SQA, uh, and as a former National Qualifications Development Officer whilst I was seconded to Education Scotland. I recall one of my first meetings at Education Scotland. My line manager at the time followed me out of the meeting. She took my face in her hands in a motherly fashion and she said to me, Jenny, you've got to stop showing what you think on your face. 
Presiding officer, I am well aware that my face gives me away in this place every single time I get up to speak about schools. Because when it comes to our schools, we as politicians have to be extremely careful of the narrative that we use in Parliament, as my colleague Gillian Martin so eloquently put in her speech earlier. There are pupils sitting their prelims in our schools right now, teachers preparing assessments right now, entering grades into their reports right now, planning lessons for tomorrow, sort sorting materials, photocopying handouts, marking jotters right now. Make no mistake, presiding officer, how we talk about the work of our teachers impacts upon staff morale. And if we are serious about closing the attainment gap, can I make some progress, please? Then we all, irrelevant of political persuasion, even you, Mr Johnson, although I see he's not here just now, need to get serious about how we motivate a profession who for too long have been booted about like a political football. We have excellent teachers in Scotland. They need our support as MSPs and they need the support of organisations in order to get it right for every child. Today I want to focus on the role of Education in Scotland and on the SQA in that context. And as was mentioned by my colleague uh, James Dornan in his opening remarks, the Education Committee's uh, survey results showed that 67% of teachers disagreed or disagreed strongly with the statement that the SQA's customers and users trust it to get it right for them. Presiding officer, as the only MSP in this chamber who has ever delivered the new qualifications, I cannot begin to explain to you how removing the outcome and assessment standards will reduce workload. We often don't talk about the specifics in this chamber, so let me do just that. In my National 4 or 5 Modern Studies class, I had 30 pupils. There were 13 unit assessment uh, standards for every pupil to sit at National 5 level. And for those at National 4, they had to pass 18. That's before they came to the final uh, exam for National 5. National 4 don't sit a final exam. This meant I would have to track 390 assessments for one class uh, in one academic year at the very minimum. And as most classes are mixed ability, the truer figure would probably be closer to 450. And as I say, that was for one class alone. The Cabinet Secretary was therefore absolutely right to move on this by removing unit assessment standards in National 5, Higher and Advanced Higher. The associated bureaucracy with the outcome and assessment standards detracted from learning and teaching. It caused the profession unnecessary stress. Conversely, we cannot allow a narrative of failure to be presented unfairly when it comes to the exam board. Indeed, my experience as an SQA marker was perhaps the single most valuable piece of professional development I ever undertook. It meant that I could go back to my department and share what I'd learned. It meant I could focus my pupils to develop their responses and gain credit accordingly. It developed my teaching style as a professional. And yet I know that professional development is currently being hindered because some head teachers are now reluctant to release their staff to attend CPD as they cannot afford to pay for supply staff. So I say today, presiding officer, that the government must look at how the SQA provides funding to schools for supply teachers to promote staff development. Because if we are to close the attainment gap, we need teachers who understand the requirements of the final exam. We don't need a profession who are scared to ask out of school. Indeed, we know that collaboration is key to driving up standards as per the recommendations outlined by the OECD. Collaboration underpinned by relevant CPD opportunities for all staff. And I want to move briefly to discuss the role of Education Scotland. Education Scotland was formed in 2011 following the amalgamation of Learning Teaching Scotland and HMI, something I was not surprised uh, to hear Tavish Scott lament earlier today. While seconded Education Scotland, I spent an inordinate amount of time writing course support materials for the new national qualifications. This was something the previous Cabinet Secretary, Michael Russell, had committed to with support from the unions. Course support materials for every National 4, National 5, Higher and Higher course and Advanced Higher course now sit on GLOW, the internet for teachers and pupils in Scotland. But in order to access these resources, teachers need a GLOW password uh, and an account to log in. However, under Learning Teaching Scotland, uh, there was a front-facing website which allowed staff to access support documents more freely. So if we're serious about our teachers engaging with the requirements of the new qualification, then Education Scotland need to think strategically about how they reach out to the profession and get them to engage with these resources. This parliament was founded upon the principles of openness and transparency. For too long, however, our education system has not operated in such a fashion. The SQA were the gatekeepers of the exam system. HMI, the inspectorate, would send their boxes to school offices across the country, the calling card of an imminent visit. But things have changed. We now have a reformed and more supportive approach to school inspections. We have, in Education Scotland, an organisation of professionals who should be readily able to engage and support the teaching profession where most HMI development officers and senior education officers began their careers in front of a class of children. As Chief Executive Dr Bill Maxwell stated in his evidence to the committee, how we implemented CFE was a collective decision. 
So, presiding officer, let's now work collectively and collaboratively to ensure we have organisations which are fit for purpose to support our teachers and enable them to get it right for every child. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jamie Green, who is the last of the closing speakers. You must be under six minutes, please, Mr Green. I'll try my best, presiding officer. Uh, first of all, may I thank the Education and Skills Committee for bringing this debate to the Chamber. And whilst it's not my own committee or my brief, I do have a substantial interest in the subject matter. It's topical and timely as well, uh, because uh, FMQ's today mention was made of the recent IPPR report, which highlights a uh, skills gap emerging in Scotland, which needs a clearer national focus. Achieving the highest standards of skills training is something I think that all of us in this chamber want for Scotland. For this reason, I would like to focus my speech on the work of Skills Development Scotland, which has the very important mission of growing our economy by ensuring that the workforces of today and tomorrow are equipped with the skills that the market conditions dictate and require. SDS has people working in schools, career centres and partner locations across the country to fulfil its colossal but very important remit. It employs over 1,200 people and has a grant of over £180 million. From influencing career choices in schools, although I do read with interest uh, some debate on whether they did have people in schools or in offices or not. Uh, Tavish Scott uh, laboured this point in a, an edu uh, education committee um, uh, notes that I was reading. Um, and I thought my committee was quite lively until I read the transcripts of the education committee. So uh, uh, it's fair to say that um, they do have a, a lot of staff in various different places uh, with modern apprenticeships and career choices in schools being pretty much the lion's share of its spend. However, based on evidence given to the committee uh, last year, the Aberdeen uh, Grampian Chamber of Commerce said that it is unclear what SDS is really trying to achieve and what the, uh, what the impact of their activity is. Of course, that is just one view, but it is one that's echoed uh, from various members uh, who submitted. In a previous debate on skills, I pointed out that Audit Scotland's comments on the bigger picture in Scotland is that there's really a significant absence of measurable targets and clear strategies set by the Scottish Government for all its economic development agencies. And I think it's very useful to heed that observation in this debate. It's very hard to scrutinise an agency or hold a government to account without a clear measure of, of its success and failures. In one interesting exchange, I note that Daniel Johnson asked SDS if they would consider a more focused set of KPIs or a more balanced scorecard, if that might be a better way of presenting its research and the vast amounts of data that accumulates. The purpose of my speech today, however, is not just to list uh, criticisms of SDS, but to raise the points that have been made to the committee. I think it is important to pick out a few of these critiques because therein may lie some of the solutions to improving the work of the agency. Uh, Aberdeen Grampian uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce and the Scottish Local Authorities Economic Development Group, which I'll refer to as SLADE, and it's worth noting who they are. They represent the economic development officers of 32 local authorities across Scotland. Uh, and they gave some excellent uh, submissions to the committee, uh, which I thoroughly recommend uh, uh, everyone reads. Both these organisations brought up the, uh, the real difficulties they have in getting in touch with the right people uh, at SDS, just simply due to the size and complexity of its uh, structure. Um, it also, the, uh, in other uh, uh, um, submissions made to the committee, uh, CBI Scotland, for example, said that challenges included the potential bureaucratic nature of interactions with that agency. There, were, there was the risk of duplication and that there uh, were absolutely opportunities for simplification in how you deal with that agency. Colleges Scotland uh, agreed with that, saying that the skills landscape in Scotland would benefit from a less complex and administratively burdensome system to monitor activities. Slade also made a number of comments about the lack of tailored approaches uh, to take into account different local authorities. They specifically mentioned uh, rural authorities in that. Uh, they commented on the lack of coordination between local authorities and SD uh, SDS. And I think that's best illustrated by the fact that there were actually very little face-to-face -face communications, something which surely can be easily fixed. Some local councils in their various submissions noted that SDS is simply highly centralised. The committee highlights that more needs to be done to evaluate initiatives so that strategies can be applied differently at national, regional and local levels. In its defence, the Chief Executive of SDS, Damien Neitz, uh, offered a robust written response to the committee on the 12th of December on some of these issues. 
I quote from his letter uh, that SDS had taken a huge number of measures to get in front of people who face redundancy in the North East, despite criticism of the agency's reaction to the downturn in the gas and oil industries in that part of Scotland. And some, something that's very topical today uh, in the news in the last few hours, we see another uh, set of job losses in that industry. So the importance of the work that uh, this agency provides is now more important than ever. Of course, these are very complex issues and more than I can really illustrate in a short speech to the Chamber today. And I do think there is commitment amongst the leadership team in that agency to continuous improvement of the work of it. Nonetheless, I've said to the, go the Scottish Government before that it must offer a detailed school uh, strategy for Scotland which shows how all agencies interweave and connect with each other as they play their own constituent part as part of an overarching strategy. That being said, we must make, make best use of what we already have. And sometimes it is the simplest of changes that have the biggest effect. In conclusion, I hope that Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Government are open to constructive criticism, because as today's motion makes clear, parliamentary scrutiny offers a vital sounding board. Thank you. We move to the closing speeches, and I have to be very strict with time. Ian Gray, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much. It's traditional on these occasions to congratulate the committee on uh, the work they've done leading up to the debate and the debate which uh, takes place. But I think um, it's important to do that today because this has been an important debate and the work undertaken by the committee uh, has been very, very important uh, indeed uh, in the evidence that they've taken. Not, uh, I have to agree with the convener because uh, they've, they've found a way to restore faith in the entire political class. Um, that, that's maybe too much to ask. Uh, but I think the committee uh, can be very clear that they have uncovered very significant home truths about some of what is happening in our education system and that is a very important contribution. Uh, that, has been, uh, that has been made. Um, we all go into schools, and a, a number of colleagues have talked about that uh, uh, in the course of the debate, and when we go into schools, um, I, I would guess that we would probably all agree that what we find there are uh, great teachers uh, doing a great job with uh, very engaged young people and pupils who are keen uh, to learn uh, and want to do well. And yet, I think we are entitled uh, to, to believe and to argue uh, that we have a problem in our education system. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, I thought, heroically mined the education statistics for a number of positive numbers, and he's very entitled to do that. But I think he has to acknowledge that objectively where we find ourselves uh, in recent months uh, is that we see a faltering performance in our education system, in our schools, uh, with uh, reductions in standards in writing, reading and maths falling down the PISA tables, but also uh, in the Scottish Government's uh, own literacy and numeracy survey. We've also seen uh, in recent years in National 4 and 5 year-on-year -year reductions in both enrolment and attainment. And I would argue last year we saw that feeding through into hires with a drop in pass rates there as well. There is a problem uh, here. I don't think... That is a problem of failing teachers, and, and Gillian Martin and Jenny Golruth both spoke about teachers being hindered uh, in their work, and I think that's, that's absolutely right. I, I think they are succeeding in spite of the circumstances in which they find themselves working. Those circumstances include budget cuts, which mean there are far fewer of them. They have fewer support staff, they have bigger classes to teach, uh, and they have less investment in resources per pupil. But what the committee have discovered, I think, uh, and uh, uh, evidenced uh, pretty comprehensively, is that those teachers are also hindered by the very bodies who are supposed to be supporting them and working effectively. That is Education Scotland uh, and the SQA. And I think the evidence cannot, cannot be denied, particularly the evidence uh, of the survey which the committee carried out. And with regard to Education Scotland, that survey showed that 36% of respondents didn't, didn't believe that Education Scotland contributed at all to building a world-class curriculum. Now, I, I just think that's astonishing. And the Cabinet Secretary asked Mr Johnson earlier, do we on this side support curriculum for excellence? Of course we support curriculum for excellence. 
It's because we support it that we're so concerned that the very body charged with ensuring effective delivery of it commands so little support amongst teachers and parents uh, and others in the education system. And as Mr Scott, who isn't here now, pointed out as a body, only 24% of Education Scotland's own staff thinks it's well run. So that has to be a serious, serious problem. But in some ways, uh, it was overshadowed by the evidence gathered around the SQA by the committee. Two thirds uh, of those respondents to the survey uh, uh, saying that the SQA uh, couldn't, uh, customers couldn't trust the SQA uh, to get it right. And Mr. Beatty ran through a number of the quotes as well, which were very trenchant and telling, and which I won't repeat. So if we have this problem, Mr. Scott, I think, made an important point. Uh, that the Cabinet Secretary and the Government are obliged to try and respond to this. I mean, for the obvious reason that they're responsible for our education system, but also because Education Scotland and the SQA are, are both, in a sense, creatures of this Government. Education Scotland was formed as a body by the SNP Government, and although the SQA, of course, predates any SNP administration, the exam system, which has caused so much difficulty, uh, does not. So it is important that the Cabinet Secretary listens to the evidence uh, of the committee uh, and acts on it. His governance review, yes, refers to Education in Scotland and SQA, but rather peripherally. peripherally. Uh, and in closing, I just want to say to Mr McGregor, uh, who asked us to be positive in our scrutiny, that the body which came out of the committee's work most positively was the Scottish Funding Council. Mm. And yet that's a body that the Scottish Government proposes to abolish, a move which is supported by nobody. It's not supported by universities, colleges, by students, or indeed by staff in those bodies. It is a manifestation of a very narrow, utilitarian view of what our universities and colleges are about. So it is an important debate, but its importance lies in the degree to which the Cabinet Secretary listens to the debate and changes direction in his reforms today. Ross Thompson, um, I'd appreciate brevity, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would also like to extend my own thanks to the Education and Skills Committee convener for opening this debate and to recognise the contribution of all committee members who since May have worked extremely well together to scrutinise the public bodies and agencies responsible for delivering Scottish education. And the thrust of my own contribution will be in relation to SQA and Education Scotland. I, alongside Fulton McGregor, had the opportunity to visit the SQA in Glasgow to discuss a range of issues with officials prior to our formal evidence session on the 23rd of November. This was extremely helpful. And from both this visit and the evidence the committee heard from Dr Janet Brown, it's quite clear that with the SQA going through an intense period of assessment redesign for Diet 18, on top of their programme of transformation, which is above the commercial activity they undertake and, of course, above business as usual, that there are quite serious issues regarding resources. In answering my question on this very issue, Dr Brown confirmed that the SQA, and I quote, fully expect to require additional resources and that in developing and delivering the new qualifications, it will be a challenge to engage with teachers, the very people we expect to deliver qualifications. Now, as Daniel Johnson and Ross Greer mentioned in their contributions, this comes at a time when the committee has received a substantial body of evidence from teachers that effective communication from the SQA is already poor and there has been a clear breakdown in trust. One submission stated, and I quote, I'm afraid that my current experience of the SQA is almost entirely negative. Documentation is highly complex, repetitive and difficult to access. To quote my committee colleague, Joanne Lamont, the SQA are living in a parallel universe if they think they have any strong working relationship with teachers. Similarly, in responding to Education Committee's survey, a majority of teachers expressed the view that Education Scotland does not improve schooling. That's either contributed not at all or a little to build a world-class curriculum, improving performance or promoting high-quality professional learning. The committee evidence has pointed to teachers being swamped in guidance and documentation. One teacher cited 81 pages of guidance across five different documents, across three different websites. The amount of bureaucracy has caused committee members to warn the SQA 
is in danger of sinking in a sea of jargon. This is almost identical to the concerns raised in relation to Education Scotland, prompting action to remove 90% of 20,000 pages of examples and case studies in a move to reduce and clarify guidance. Further, there was serious concern from teachers that some exams were the worst they had ever seen. Mistakes and inaccuracies plagued the National Five computing exams, higher maths, higher geography. And in his evidence to the committee on the 2nd of November, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills stated that it is intolerable that there are errors in exam papers. Dr Janet Brown stated we should not have errors in our exam papers, yet these errors are happening. Teachers raised real concern with the committee that there have been so many mistakes from the exam to the UASP and we no longer trust anything that comes from the SQA. Now, it has been touched uh, in contributions, particularly by Fulton McGregor, um, uh, in relation to this. And I have to admit, I do draw a slightly different conclusion with regard to exams overall, um, because there is powerful and consistent criticism from teachers that there is actually a lack of effective scrutiny and transparency. The SQA believe that these mistakes are happening because people are working extremely hard, and that's a quote, and that there is a need for the SQA to have, and again I quote, appropriate engagements and institutions in place to improve quality assurance. From the evidence, it's quite clear that both resource issues and failings in leadership need to be addressed. Fundamentally, the fact is that the SQA and Education Scotland have lost the trust and the confidence of teachers, and this should raise the most serious of concerns for all of us. If teachers don't have faith in them, how on earth can we expect parents to? And to have faith in an education system that delivers quality education to their children. Uh, I would like to make progress, again. I've got a tight six minutes. This highlights the urgency of action and intervention which is needed to restore that trust and confidence. Deputy Presiding Officer, the committee's work since May has uncovered a number of serious issues which require urgent resolution. If we are going to collectively meet our ambition to narrow the attainment gap and provide the best possible education to our young people, then there's a lot of work to do. And it's clear that the committee is playing a critical and constructive role in this ongoing debate. Now, it could not be clearer that in the decisions that are going to have to be taken, they must be based on a sound foundation of evidence, a point that was extremely well made by Ross Greer during his own contribution on the SFC and, all, and, and the Scottish Government's uh, Enterprise and Skills Review. So those of us on these benches look forward to continuing to work in a constructive manner to put forward new ideas, and that is why we will be supporting the motion in the name of the convener today. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call John Swinney. Up to eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, three of my colleagues ha have made important points in this debate about the narrative that is underpinning this debate and the importance of ensuring that that na narrative is uh, correctly and effectively ascribed, because there are consequences of what members of Parliament say in parliamentary debates and implications in a wider audience. Gillian Martin, I think, quite rightly and fairly raised the comment that Willie Rennie made at First Minister's question time, that our, his quote was that our schools are in crisis. I utterly refute that point, totally refute that point, and I'm glad Gillian Martin called him out for it. Jenny Goruth talked about the fact that as we're having this debate, looking at all of these issues, others are preparing for their prelims or are setting, setting coursework and taking forward important judgments on these points. And Richard Lockhead made the point that at the same time as we're having this debate, uh, there will be local authorities in the country trying to recruit teachers to fill the vacancies that I acknowledge we have in schools around the country. And does it look like an attractive profession to come into when some of the narrative is as uh, negative as it is. And I have to say, Mr Johnson, Mr Gray highlighted, Mr, Mr, jo Mr Gray said that I had heroically mined all sorts of things to come up with data. And, you know, yes, I've presented data which is representative of Scottish education today because I also, to complete the picture, and I said it in my speech, and before I made two statements to Parliament before the Christmas recess about the PISA statistics and also about the performance data, which I acknowledged 
was uncomfortable reading, but Mr Johnson's characterisation of Scottish education was atrocious in what he said today. And I th I'm all for a, a balanced and fair debate about it, but I invite members to make a considered contribution. Mr Thompson has just talked about making uh, uh, effective scrutiny, and I'm all for effective scrutiny. I can take criticism. I've taken criticism in this place for nine and a half years as a minister. But we've got to be conscious of the consequences and implications of what members of parliament say about the, uh, the implications in a wider audience. I'll take Mr Johnson first since I've named Daniel him. Daniel Johnson. Uh, on, on those points, I mean, when the chief executive of the SQA itself is saying that the issues faced are to do with the way that they plan, implement, and the way the examinations work, it doesn't get more brutal than that. It is not that I'm plucking this rule. Their own chief executive is raising fundamental questions about the way her agency works and the way the exam works. Is that not pretty fundamental and brutal? Does that not justify well, the concern? Well, John Swinney. Uh, well, I, I think if Mr Johnson... I, I invite Mr Johnson to go back and look at the speech he delivered at the start of this debate and judge whether he thinks it is the type of contribution that helps us to have a constructive debate about where we're moving to, to, progress, Scottish, to pr progress Scottish education. Because that's what, that's what I'm interested in, and I'm quite interested in an open debate about how we do that, because I accept that all members of Parliament want Scottish education to be successful. But we're going to have difficulty turning around the teacher shortage problem that Mr Lockhead quite rightly highlighted if the narrative about Scottish education is as dismally presented as by people yep. like Mr Johnson mm -hmm. has presented in this debate yeah. today. Now, I want to move on to, uh, and, 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 if we, and if we actually look at the, you know, the, the, the independent survey on SQA performance, which is carried out annually by an independent third party, demonstrated 84% of respondents believe the SQA has high credibility and 91% believe the SQA can be trusted. So I'm not saying that there's not a need to improve performance because Mr Greer has properly raised issues with me about the accuracy of exam papers and I've given them honest, open answers about how that's not acceptable. And that has to be addressed, and I've addressed it face to face with the Chief Executive of the SQA. But we have to keep, as I think Mr Lockhead did in the debate, a sense of perspective about some of the data and the information that is presented here. Now, I want to move on to a substantive... I'm very sorry that Tavish Scott isn't here. I understand why he's not here. But I, I want to move on to address some of the issues that he raised, because he talked about uh, the uh, implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. And Curriculum for Excellence has been implemented by a management board, and I want to read to Parliament the members of the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board, or the organisations that sit around the CFE Management Board. The Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland, the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, the College Development Network, COSLA, the Educational Institute of Scotland, the General Teaching Council for Scotland, the National Association for Schoolmasters and the Union of Women Teachers, the National Parent Forum of Scotland, School Leaders Scotland, the Scottish Council of Independent Schools, the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association, the Scottish Teacher Education Committee, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, Skills Development Scotland, University Scotland, Education Scotland, the Scottish Government, Community Learning and Development Manager Group in Scotland. Now that body is responsible for advising ministers on the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. And if I flick through all the responses that I've got from in the governance review, they are littered with people saying to me, don't disturb the consensus. Make sure there's always a consensus. And that board has operated by consensus. I can only find one occasion on which ministers have overturned a, a recommendation of, well, it actually wasn't a recommendation of the board, it was they took a majority view of the board where the board couldn't operate with unanimity. But my point is that in the, pers the criticism that's been levelled here about the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence, and, I'm, and, I'll, and I'm, you know, Parliament knows me well enough to know, I'll take criticism on the chin. I've, I'm well enough able to do that. But we've acted, my predecessors have acted, to work with consensus with all that whole range of bodies to make sure that we took people with us in implementing Curriculum for Excellence. So some of the criticism levelled at our bodies is unwarranted as if they have acted unilaterally in taking forward these points. Mr Gray wanted to, get, to come in. If he still wants to, I'll give way. Ian Gray. The, the point I was going to make is that the Cabinet Secretary has, what, 40 seconds left? Is he going to address the issues raised by the work of the committee 
or is he just going to read out another big long list to fill up the time? Oh, oh well, well, oh. Mr. Green knows me well enough. Mr. Green, that's a pathetic intervention. Of all the pathetic interventions I've heard from Mr. Green, that is at the top of the list. Because the point I'm making is that education involves taking a whole range of organisations with us in a cohesive fashion, and that's how Curriculum for Excellence has actually been implemented in the process. I'll give way to uh, Liz, uh, Liz Smith if she wants to. Liz Smith. Th thank, thank you. And as uh, someone who has made a presentation uh, submission to the Governance Review, and it's maybe not quite as consensual as uh, some of the other ones, I think the point, Cabinet Secretary, is that while that board has been operating, hopefully with some consensus, the delivery mechanism, which we have been scrutinising at committee, is blurred. It is not clear about the data that has been presented. And the fundamental question which we're asking as a committee is in terms of the delivery of the curriculum for excellence, which we cannot at this stage properly measure. That's the issue. You only have seconds. Well, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are many issues in amongst all of that. But what I say to Parliament is that I will, I, I will look carefully at all of these issues as part of the governance review. I hear what the committee says. I've reflected on it in my opening remarks about all of these issues. But I simply make the point, the significant point to Parliament, that we have operated by consensus in taking forward curriculum for excellence, involving a whole range of bodies with an implementation group that's a subset of that group to take forward these changes. And that's been the model of operation that we have taken forward. Now, of course, the government will uh, we'll look at these issues carefully because what drives our determination is to improve Scottish education and to make sure that education can deli deliver the best for the life chances of young people in Scotland. I call Johan Lamont to wind up the debate. A very tight 10 minutes, please, Ms Lamont. It'll feel a lot tighter for me than it will for you, I suspect. Um, can I say, first of all, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for the opportunity to contribute to this debate in my role as Deputy Convener. Now, this role provides me with a number of challenges. First of all, I've got 10 minutes to speak, and it's been quite a while since I've had the opportunity to speak at such length in the Chamber. And I, that is something of a challenge for me, although I suspect a greater one for the rest of you in the Chamber. Secondly, given the importance of these issues, um, inevitably, as we have seen already, it generates some partisan and robust exchanges. So unusually, it falls on me to be the voice of reasonableness and of consensus. And I'm sure my fellow committee members will draw my attention pretty quickly if I um, fail in that responsibility. It is my intention, therefore, to do a number of things. I shall resist the temptation to respond in the way perhaps that I would normally do. But I want particularly to highlight the important issues that need to be explored and to emphasise the degree to which there was consensus within the committee on um, scrutinising the critical role of SQASTS, Scottish Funding Council and Education Scotland. So the purpose of this debate has been to highlight to the Parliament and Government evidence in the performance of these bodies and to bring these issues to the attention of non-committee members. It is a pressure on all of us as elected members to understand what is happening in our education system and we shouldn't be operating in the silos created by our own committee membership. It's an opportunity to highlight and prompt further debate on the government reviews of these bodies and how these reviews will assist rather than hamper in government policy and to inform the work of other committees. If ever there was a need for joined up working, it is in education and how it relates to the economy, to economic and social opportunity and to equality. Scrutiny should not be a series of episodes. It needs to be robust, far reaching and coherent. And as Richard Lockhead pointed out, Education isn't just about the curriculum. It can be the many, many things that children bring into school with them or as adults that we experience. But that does not mean that we shouldn't drill down in the specifics within the Education Committee. But I would urge other committees and members to look at those broader questions and how they impact on the capacity of people to learn. I want particularly to put on record my thanks to James Dornan, the convener, for his great good nature, nature and capacity to bring the committee together to other committee members and to the clerks. And I think we have proven to be an effective team, and I, I would argue, in drilling down on the evidence and producing compelling reflections on the challenges ahead. I would also wish to emphasise, as the convener did, that this work remains an act in progress. And our commitment to all those who have taken the trouble to respond individually, all those academics and organisations who care passionately about education, 
They have taken the time to engage fully to provide their expertise and thinking that we shall persist with this work. Because we do need to reaffirm the importance of education skills in the work of the Scottish Government, of local authorities, in the agencies we scrutinise and reflect on why all this matters. A coherent approach to education skills is fundamental to any notion of a fairer society, of a strong economy and shared prosperity. Education matters in ensuring individuals can achieve their full potential, no matter where they are. The challenge in education is to provide that opportunity. But if we have to be, we have to be alive to the possibility that education may compound inequality rather than address it if we get these matters wrong. We know that a highly skilled and educated population are important factors in economic opportunities. And that's why these bodies charged with delivery do need to rise to that challenge. And we do need to reflect on the concerns that are expressed about their capacity. It's essential that there is confidence in the education system. Much of our evidence identified the need for leadership and many concerns about the apparent lack of leadership within these agencies. At a time of significant curriculum change, there needs to be confidence in those delivering it, if it is not to undermine the confidence in the changes themselves. And that means if we believe that curriculum for excellence is the right way forward, we do need to address issues which may suggest to people that this is too much hassle, isn't working, we should try something else. And I would say to the government minister and to others that we ought not to shoot the messenger when people are raising concerns. As a teacher of 20 years standing, I understand the fear articulated by uh, a number of, of members opposite, but at the concerns about raising the questions of concern about the system being seen as an attack on teachers and on young people. But I do think there was a consensus in the committee about the need to serve the interests of teachers, young people and educators by insisting that those who work to them are actually doing their job. And if I may make a number of observations around the committee's consideration, I hope these will inform the Chamber further. First, the response of teachers, given the opportunity to comment anonymously, was profoundly thought-provoking and ought not to be underestimated. Of course, we might choose to explain it away, but I don't think we do anyone a service in doing so. In all my years serving in committees of this Parliament, I have never been so struck by the number and the passion and the compelling arguments made by people responding. And it, for, for some, I think the SQA's instinct was to say these are the usual suspects. I worked with usual suspects when we introduced standard grade. What comes out, rises from these responses, is a passionate commitment by teachers and professionals to make curriculum for excellence work rather than those who are so conservative that they don't want the trouble of it. The frustration of committee members when hearing evidence from the SQA and others was evident about responsibilities, about workload, about advice. The committee was concerned not just about who is responsible, but how that responsibility was being delivered. And there was a lack of clarity in that regard. And of course, there's a concern about the cluttered landscape and the complexity and how these things are difficult. But that landscape and that cluttering was person made. And I recognise the work of the Cabinet Secretary in addressing the question of, of workload, but there has to be a rigour in addressing that cluttered landscape and make it work for people who care about education. There needs to be an energy from the bodies that we were scrutinising to sort these problems out rather than using them as an alibi. Um, there are some significant themes that we'd, we, I would also want to highlight, in particular, I think, the whole question of evidence in underpinning action by government. There's an important example of the stage one review on skills and the action on the overarching body, and particularly in relation to the Scottish Funding Council. I think it's true the committee may have been persuaded or may not, but they did not have the evidence to make that decision. In, in relation to curriculum for excellence, we understand that there's no baseline evidence to help assess its effectiveness. And that is a significant problem because the danger is that we find a conflation between the danger of falling standards may be explained by the Curriculum for Excellence, when that may not be the problem at all. We do need to know through the statistics what is actually happening. And that question too relates to school governance. In the remaining time, 
I want to emphasise a strand of the committee's work in relation to equalities and want to identify a number of examples that will be worthy of further consideration by the Parliament and by the Government. While we all know there was a general commitment to the curriculum for excellence, one of the questions we asked in committee was who decided there should be no external examination for National 4? And I think that is a question of equality. I doubt I would have supported that decision if I had been asked. But in all of our evidence, we could not get clarity on who made that decision and why. Indeed, on being asked about the advisability of such an approach, we were told by Janet Brown, and I quote, that is one of the conversations Scotland as a whole needs to have. If that's a conversation Scotland needs to have, somebody needs to initiate that conversation, and pretty soon too. Secondly, there was concerns expressed by the NUS and others about the decisions within the college sector to cut part-time places by 40% were advised in evidence to the committee. The issue is not whether there are successful learners coming out of colleges under this new policy, but we do know that this policy chooses disproportionately to disbar women, carers, adult learners and people with disabilities. The government cannot ignore that impact if they're committed to access in equal terms. <coughs> the issue of access is equally reflected in committee discussion on the question of modern apprenticeships. It was, I believe, a concern to the committee that the Skills Development Scotland did not see itself as having a role in ensuring access to modern apprenticeships across our different groups in our communities. If public money identified to improve skills is less likely to be spent on women, people within a black and minority ethnic community, amongst disabled people, there is a problem. And it is not good enough for Skills Development Scotland to say it's a societal problem and therefore not address the fair distribution of public funding. In conclusion, the committee in its work was exploring education policy and whether the policy choices make sense. The committee in this debate has sought to reflect the challenge in putting policy into action and is reasonable to seek clarity on how delivery is being progressed, how that is lived by teachers and students, not just how theoretically we might view it. And I think there is some anxiety that their agencies are not in control of that agenda. Our convener commented on the reflections that perhaps we had brought um, some credibility to politicians. What I think is here is a reflection in the gap between politics and the real world. And I think in this debate, the committee has sought to bridge that gap. I trust members here and the government will reflect on our evidence, not to pick holes in it, not to explain it away, but as a significant contribution to draw upon in ensuring that our commitment on education is being delivered fully by the agencies who have given that responsibility and given voice to by the Scottish Government. I commend the report and the evidence of the committee to this Parliament and look forward to continuing this work in the next stage. Thank you. That concludes the Education Committee debate. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3396 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for next week. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I would call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 3396. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. I put the question to the Chamber. The question is that we is that motion number 3396 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. There's one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 3298 in the name of James Dornan on behalf of the Education Committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>